Adoption of the minutes from our March 27th meeting. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Morocco. Any discussion to the minutes? Hey, all those in favor? Okay, thank you. Disclosures of pecuniary interest, Councillor Wing. Uh, yes, planning matter AM 2012-002, I own abutting properties. Okay, thank you. Councillor Peter Angelo. Thank you, Your Worship. There's a wire transfer made out to my employer in Mega Traffic to Six Cooper. Okay. Councillor Thompson. Yes, uh, report L2012-09 and the encroachment agreement. Um, I'm declaring a conflict. I don't really think I do, but uh, I work for a company who owns this company, so I'll declare a conflict. Okay. <clears throat> Any other? Okay, and for myself, check number 353. Four zero zero, a check made out to myself. Oh. Yes, Councillor Wing. Uh, I think I better declare conflict on that as well because my husband has contracts with the company that owns that company. So. Okay. You got both of those. Okay. <clears throat> uh, presentations and deputations. Our first one uh, has been deferred from tonight. Uh, we will be having Captain William Fielding, who received the Medal of Military Valor for heroic actions while serving in Afghanistan. Uh, they had a death in the family, and he will be here at our next meeting in May. Uh, next up for deputations, uh, do we have Robin Hamlin here? Ha Ro yes. Robin Hamlin, regarding Blue Community, she's a 13-year-old from Kingston. She's going to address council on being a Blue Community. Come on up. Welcome, Robin. Mayor Diodati, members of council and staff for having me here. You have no idea how happy I am coming here to talk to all of you. My name is Robin Hamlin. I'm 13 years old and I'm a grade 8 student from Kingston. I'm here to talk to you tonight, tonight about the world's water problem and how we can help. Last June, my teacher showed our class a video called Blue Gold World Water Wars, a documentary made in 2008 and directed by Sam Botso. This two movie taught me so much, and it made me want to do something about the issue. Just some of the facts that I've learned from this movie are these. Our Earth holds 97% salt water, 3% fresh water. Almost all of that 3% is already polluted. Most provinces charge big water companies next to nothing to take water from our aquifers in springs, and whole watersheds are now threatened. Because Canada is a water-rich country, we tend to take our water for granted and use up water faster than it can be replenished through natural systems. Just around the Great Lakes, we pump almost 3.2 trillion liters of water a day. 7.4 billion liters do not get returned. Canada, Russia, and Brazil are the water-rich countries of the world. As fresh water starts to disappear or become polluted, the rest of the world will look to these three countries for a water source. America has severe water problems and is already planning canals able to move Canadian water into America. I know that the Great Lakes are our main target as both America and Canada share them. What is really scary though is that they are saying this will probably happen within 10 to 20 years from now, when I myself am a young adult. After seeing this movie, it made me want to do something. So I told my mom how I felt about this, and she said if I wanted to, I could write a letter to our mayor, Mark Gerritsen. I did, and Mayor Gerritsen invited me to meet with him. I was very nervous, and I wanted to be prepared for my meeting. So I emailed the director of the movie, Sam Botso. I asked him if there was anything specific to Kingston that I should ask in this meeting. He got me in touch with Maud Barlow, who is the author of the book that the movie was based on. MOD belongs to the Council of Canadians, which is an organization that brings the Canadians together to act for social, economic, and environmental justice in Canada and throughout the world. I was told that asking my mayor to make Kingston a blue community would be a positive step in the right direction. A blue community treats water as belonging to no one, and is the responsibility of all. It must be governed by principles that allow for reasonable use, equal distribution, and reasonable treatment in order to preserve water for nature and for future generations like me. 
There are three resolutions that need to be passed in order for resolution in order for a community to become a blue community. The first one is banning the sale of bottled water in public facilities and at municipal events. Bottled water companies are selling us our own water for huge profit that we can easily get from our own tap. To manufacture one liter of bottled water, three to five liters of water is required. Bottled water companies require massive amounts of fossil fuels to manufacture and transport their bottles, which also contributes to another problem in our world, which is our climate change. And as for the recycling of these bottles, an unimaginable amount end up in our landfills. There was an article in the Toronto Sun that said as few as 50% of the water bottles Torontonians consume every day are actually being recycled. This means that as many as 65 million empty plastic water bottles per year end up as garbage in a landfill waste site. And that's just <coughs> Toronto. In order to convince people to spend 200 to 3,000 times more than what they spend on tap water, bottled water companies say that their water is safer. But this isn't true. Bottled water is regulated as a food under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. This means that the water bottling plants are inspected on average only once every three years. Municipal tap water is tested continuously before and after treatment. They say that they are providing healthier alternatives, but we have to open our eyes and look at the costs. Overpumping of our precious water, destruction of our watersheds, and all the greenhouse gases produced in trying to give us a healthier alternative that we can easily get from our own tap. The City of Niagara Falls is already doing the right thing by adopting the Blue W program that I've been told, and I've been told that not only have you already banned the sale of bottled water, but all other plastic beverages as well. From the bottom of my, of my heart, I want to thank you. I know that there's one exception though, and that is with your community center where you have one vendor with a pre-existing contract. The wording of this resolution can be changed to say, the City of Niagara Falls has already banned the sale of bottled water in public facilities and at municipal events, and is committed to initiate a phasing out of the sale of bottled water at our community facility. And then, you can add a date of when your contract expires. The second resolution is recognizing water as a human right. We want water to be used responsibly <coughs> and distributed fairly. Now I know that some communities are scared of this resolution. They think it's an international issue. But I completely disagree. I believe that we need to start small, person by person, community by community. And then this will grow into a national level. And then hopefully to an international level. We can do this. The third and last resolution is promoting publicly financed, owned and operated water and wastewater services. We need to protect our water resources and keep our water services publicly owned. When water and sanitation services are privatized, the workforce usually gets cut and the price to the customer gets increased. In the end, service is poor and the company ends up with the bigger profits. The City of Niagara Falls has already has publicly owned and operated water and wastewater services. So this resolution should not be difficult to pass. I was invited to present to our City Council on September 20th. They had already banned the sale of bottled water and their wa water and wastewater services were already publicly owned. They passed the Human Right Resolution and declared themselves a blue community. After that, I did a mass mailing in November to mayors across Ontario and had an overwhelming response to them. Since then, I've made trips in December, February, and a large one over my March break. I've had 16 different meetings with mayors and councillors. I've presented to five different councils, Clarington, Caledon, Norfolk, Pickering, and St. Catharines, and had three different mayors present to me at their councils for me. The town of Ajax got all three resolutions passed. The city of Burlington passed the human right resolution. And I'm, and I'm awaiting word on Owen Sound. 
I've been invited back to present at council meetings in Chatham-Kent, Cambridge, Brantford, Guelph, Newmarket, Meaford, Oshawa, and Vaughan. I'm here tonight to ask all of you to help <coughs> me pass these three, three resolutions, to help me save our water. I can't do this without you. Please pass these three important resolutions to make the city of Niagara Falls a blue community. I'm on a mission, and it's going to take me a long time to make a difference. I'm starting small by going from community to community. I eventually want to work my way up to presenting to the premiers of each of our provinces, and then to the prime minister. But I cannot do this without your help. I'm only a teenager, and they're not going to listen to me unless I have people on my side that think and feel the same way as I do. I believe in the power of one, and I want to believe that even though our reality looks extremely bad right now, if we work together, if we band together, we can help save our Earth's water supply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Robin did a very nice job. Very impressive. You've really done your homework, and you, you did a really nice job presenting. And I know we're, uh, sorry, we're your fifth council or your sixth council? We're your sixth? Sixth. Well, um... Council, you've you've heard the, the presentation from Miss Hamlin. Now, let me ask you something, uh, Robin. Did you did you drive down from Kingston specifically for this tonight? I I've made um, I drove down here on Monday, and I've made presentations in Welland, Waterloo. I presented to Council in St. Catharines, and presenting here, and also to Niagara Region tomorrow. Okay, so. good, excellent. That's excellent. Well, uh, first of all, is there any questions uh, or comments for uh, for Miss Hamlin of the council? Okay, she now she's uh, made a request that we look at uh, a resolution, three different parts to a to a resolution. Do we have some comment or some direction? Maybe we can. Uh, yes, Councillor Thompson. Well, I think that's uh, a very uh, first of all, congratulations and thank you for being here. Uh, water uh, is without exception, extremely uh, important. Uh, and uh, you only have to uh, travel to foreign countries and uh, <coughs> see uh, the importance of uh, uh, potable water. Uh, the three uh, resolutions uh, uh, for us, I think, are very simple. Uh, we've already banned the plastic water bottles. Uh, extending that to, uh, in fact, I think the council has already indicated that when the contract runs out at the uh, Bain Center that that uh, will uh, will not continue and out of fairness it shouldn't and uh, that water is a, uh, a human resource uh, which is uh, certainly special and and uh, of a concern to us I think those three resolutions are uh, automatic and we already have the public uh, uh, treatment and uh, uh, water facilities uh, through the region and I don't anticipate that to change. So I would make the three resolutions. Okay, very good. We've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Wing, that we adopt all three of your resolutions. Yes, Councillor Gates. First of all, I want to congratulate you for coming down here. And the fact <coughs> that you talked to uh, Mar Barlow uh, is an incredible woman who uh, actually has taken on this fight for a long, long time. And uh, the one that you're absolutely right is our water our city water is as good as any bottled water you can purchase, without a doubt. Uh, it's done locally. Uh, it's tested a lot more than the bottled water. Uh, to have a 13-year-old come all the way down here uh, to champion uh, protecting our water supply for not only ourselves, but more importantly for our kids, our grandkids, uh, I compliment you on you. And uh, good luck when you go from council to council uh, right across the province of Ontario. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's great. Well done. Is there any other discussions or questions? Yes, the clerk would like to comment. Uh, just I draw council's attention to the first communication on your <coughs> agenda this evening, which you may want to uh, include in this motion. It's from our uh, our water coordinator, and it's asking that May 6th to 12th be proclaimed as Drinking Water Week, which obviously is very appropriate with Robin being here this evening. Okay, so it's been included in the motion by Councillor Thompson and Councillor Wing. It's ironic, you hear, obviously you're in Niagara Falls where uh, all the water from the Great Lakes comes our way. And 20% uh, of the world's fresh water, obviously you know that. Um, well, we've got the motion on the floor with, a, with an addition that we include the uh, Water Week as well. And if there are no, no more comments, and we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Congratulations, Robin. Good job.
You know, it's great, and I'm, I see you're here with your mother, I believe, and she's very proud of you. I'm very sure, I'm very certain of that, and, and it's really nice, you know, when we can encourage the youth that they champion causes like this, that'll be good for the future for everybody. So, and no one would appreciate it any more than anyone that comes to Niagara Falls. People come all over the world just to watch that beautiful fresh water cascade over. So congratulations, Robin. We're happy for you. Next up on our presentations and deputations, we've got the Niagara Falls Lions Legacy Trail. And to present to council tonight, we've got Jim Fife from the Niagara Falls Lions Club. Jim, would you like to step up, please? Your Worship, uh, members of council, um, my name is Jim Fife, and I am a member of the Niagara Falls <coughs> Lions Club. On June the 9th, uh, the Niagara Falls Lions Club will be celebrating its 90th year of service to this community. I actually have tickets if anybody's interested in buying, um, <laughs> but uh, you can see me after the meeting. <laughs> we have uh, ex extremely uh, taken um, pride in the accomplishments that we've had over 90 years and it is indeed a privilege uh, for us to serve this great community uh, over those 90 years. <coughs> and uh, we've now come to a stage where we would like to take on another project and uh, it has to meet two criteria. Number one, our motto is to serve and secondly, we want to meet the needs of the residents of Niagara Falls. So we had some brainstorming sessions as to what are the needs of the citizens of uh, this great community. Uh, uh, participating in those uh, meetings were his, his worship and uh, staff was also involved in, in helping us uh, to uh, come up with uh, some potential needs. The one that tweaked our interest the most um, was a section of the Millennium Trail. And as council is aware, there's two sections of the Millennium Trail that are constructed, uh, one running from uh, McLeod Road, and <coughs> last year we just opened uh, the second section running from Morrison Street to uh, uh, Thorlstone Road. The, uh, the interest or the uniqueness to this uh, stage of the um, uh, Millennium Trail uh, it has several uh, unique features. Number one, uh, is that it will be a connection from the existing trail uh, that concludes at uh, Thorlstone Road. And uh, will, uh, so it runs from uh, Thorlstone Road North to Whirlpool Road. And I have for council, let me just pass this around. So the Niagara Falls Legacy Trail, as I just defined, uh, is really the third section of uh, the current Millennium Trail. The uniqueness is that it would be a continuous trail. And the exciting part of this continuous is that you can, the residents can walk a bike from Morrison Street at Portage Road and go all the way to Niagara Mill Lake. The residents of Niagara Falls can, can walk or bike from Morrison Street at Portage Road and go all the way to Fort Erie. The, because the other connection to this uh, section of the trail is to the Niagara Parksway. And as we're all aware, Niagara Parks has a, a trail which runs from Niagara Lake to Fort Erie. So I just find that this is uh, an unbelievable opportunity uh, this will serve uh, the residents uh, not only uh, today but of future generations. It truly will be a legacy in itself. Uh, the design of the trail uh, has some unique features which the other two sections will not have. Uh, number one, there's going to be a connection to um, uh, Swayze Drive or to Stanley Street, as you can see on the, on the sketch, which means that uh, uh, the residents around uh, Kerr Park and our uh, well, Kerr Park being uh, another uh, recreational uh, amenity that we have, you can be able to go from that part of the community, Swayze Road, 
uh, bringing it right into uh, connecting and then going right into the Niagara Parks Commission. None of the other trails have that uh, uh, potential of connecting. The other uh, aspect is that there are no uh, residents uh, around the trail from a land use perspective. And uh, we've had some feedback from the users of the existing trails and uh, there has been a plea to uh, incorporate lighting uh, for safety reasons and, and um, uh, some other valid reasons. So uh, that is a design component that uh, we don't have any objections with uh, the surrounding neighbors and uh, that's also part of uh, the design. The, um, not only is it um, uh, our 90th anniversary, but it's also, of course, the bicentennial. And um, I've been accused that the, um, the game plan for this trail, or the uh, construction uh, uh, agenda, I would like to see this trail <coughs> completely constructed and officially opened mid-October of this year. Um, now, why October? Uh, in October, there will be uh, a significant event in this uh, region. There will be the reenactment of the Battle of Queenston Heights, also the reenactment of the burial of Brock. Uh, this is such a significant event that we're anticipating that the Prime Minister of Canada will be in attendance. So we want to coordinate the, the opening of this trail with that event. The design of the trail uh, will meet exactly the same standards that um, uh, we have presently in the tra uh, Millennium Trail system, uh, the width of the asphalt, uh, the base, and all of that. The uh, estimated cost of this uh, project uh, is $370,000. Uh, if we include uh, the uh, addition of lighting, uh, it brings the, uh, the value of this uh, arrangement up to uh, $595, or $595,000. Um, of course, this is something that is way beyond the means of uh, Niagara Falls Lions Club. But we have, we are searching for for partners. We have established a few partners. Uh, we have uh, some corporate um, sponsorship from our uh, citizens and, and companies in the uh, uh, Niagara Falls. We anticipate that this will truly be a community trail system. It is a community project. We're anticipating and hoping that through the sponsorship and partnerships that we will establish that this will not cost the taxpayers of Niagara Falls anything. Uh, so with that, <coughs> Niagara Falls Alliance Club would respectfully request council to endorse this project and to forward it to staff to expedite the project in partnership with the Niagara Falls Alliance Club and other partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fife. We appreciate that presentation. Uh, yes, Councillor Thompson. Uh, just to uh, congratulate them on their 90th uh, anniversary, but uh, uh, for coming forward uh, with such a, a worthwhile project uh, and taking on the financial responsibility. And if he's looking for a motion to uh, refer to staff and endorse that, uh, I'd certainly be happy to and thank them for being here. Thank you very much. Okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, uh, Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by. Yeah, Your Worship, I'll second the motion, and I just wanted to say, I guess, uh, through <coughs> you to Mr. Feist, thank you. Uh, it's an amazing gift to the city of Niagara Falls. As you've already mentioned, uh, this uh, this section of the trail here is probably one of the most important because it connects us to the Niagara Park Commission Trail, mm -hmm. and from there you can go as far as you want uh, down the trail and all the way back. So. It's a very important uh, section of the trail and it's a very generous offer for me to come forward. Thank you very much and, and I'm extremely excited about it too. It's amazing our trails as we've been putting them in, the, the amount of people, the activity that's on them is just incredible. It's really exciting to see as people are engaging the community. Are there any? Yes, Councillor Wing. The lighting especially is good because I know that's been a concern about the existing sections. All I can say is uh, I don't have a problem endorsing a good project that won't cost the uh, taxpayers of Niagara Falls anything. 
It's kind of hard to say no to free money, <laughs> right? And I know you're partnering with a lot of the other groups, and that'll that'll come forward as uh, as the project moves forward. So, so we do have a motion uh, by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angel, that we endorse, expedite, and refer to staff. Okay. If there's no other uh, comments, then we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. It's unanimous. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Jim. Now, is it true you wear that jacket once in a while to Augusta just to screw the guys around? Is that <laughs> Yeah, no, okay. No, I didn't actually earn it. Okay. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Hamlin, too, if, if hopefully you don't run away too quick. Uh, we've asked, uh, we're going to have a little something as you, as you go away to take with you. So just hang tight for just a few minutes if you don't mind. Okay, next up, uh, we move on to planning matters. I'd now ask the city clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda. Your Worship, a public meeting is now being con convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a cottage rental dwelling at 5401 River Road. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, January 27, 2012, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Okay, thank you very much. I now ask Mr. Bolabrook to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Firstly, I want to apologize to Council. We um, had fully intended to have uh, uh, a report here tonight uh, dealing with the policies of the official plan to deal with cottage rental dwellings, but unfortunately, uh, we still have some work to do on that, and we had already previously advertised for this public meeting, so we're going to move forward. Um, this uh, is the example of the house in question um, along uh, River Road. And this uh, picture here just depicts the nature of uh, some of the, or the locations, mind you, of some of the um, uh, bread and breakfast we have in the uh, River Road Satellite District. Uh, we show uh, a number of uh, the bed and breakfasts which are allowed as of right. Uh, you'll see several of them here. Uh, the subject property is in dark black. But we've also shown some of the licensed cottage rental dwellings that exist. Um, and there are in arrows here, and there's three or four up in this area here. So it gives you an idea that uh, it's, a, it's, it's um, a very popular area for uh, tourist types of uh, accommodation uh, with both the mix of uh, bed and breakfast and, um, and cottage rental dwellings. To give some background, we're dealing with a, um, a site that um, has asked for a couple of different uh, special uh, uh, exceptions as part of the bylaw amendment, and that is to recognize the uh, north side yard setback, it, it's uh, deficient, and also to increase the maximum parking area in the rear yard. So if this is approved by council, we would include those in the bylaw amendment. I did mention that uh, we did have a council meeting in February which uh, council deferred uh, making the decision on the application pending the results of a separate staff report. Um, so um, we fully intend to come back with uh, that report as, as soon as we can. There's a number of, we've had some input from a number of the area residents. Uh, they've made some uh, good suggestions for us to, uh, to uh, mull over and um, I'm not quite sure when we'd have that ready. I, I know um, um, the town of Blue Mountain is one, is one municipality that has actually uh, set in place regulations uh, for cottage rental dwellings and uh, we're anxiously awaiting um, some of their um, results because it, it did go to the Ontario Municipal Board and uh, also is going through additional legal uh, um, steps there. So the open house we had on January 12th for this particular application, we had one neighbor attend who dropped off a letter uh, the, the types of concerns that were expressed in the letter included excessive noise, group staying um, in the house, parking problems, uh, the size of the groups, uh, some drug use apparently, and use of the fire pit. This is the actual site plan showing the um, property. Uh, this is the frontage along River Road. Uh, the house uh, is quite, quite elevated from the road. Uh, access is uh, obtained from River Lane at the back and the parking uh, 
pardon me, the parking is uh, in this area here. I'm losing my, my uh, pointer. But anyway, we'll proceed along. Um, the official plan, uh, land in the River Road Satellite Tourist <laughs> District does provide for alternative forms of accommodation. It does talk about uh, bed and breakfast. It does not specifically say cottage rental dwellings, but does talk about uh, accommodating other forms of, of, uh, of accommodation. The, uh, it complies, this uh, application does comply with the official plan. Uh, cottage rental dwellings is a form of small scale short term tourist accommodation uh, that would be permitted. It's similar to the bed and breakfast. It's not a bed and breakfast. We know that bed and breakfast do uh, have uh, owner occupancy and we know that they serve uh, breakfast in the morning and the cottage rental dwelling does not. Uh, the residential character is maintained. Uh, also cottage rental dwellings um, are rented to a single group of travelers. They should not generate any more traffic than a, a normal typical dwelling. Uh, in this case we would recommend that the number of bedrooms be limited to four and occupancy to eight persons. Um, currently there's one approved cottage rental dwelling within a 300 meter radius and we do not think that that's a uh, particularly undue concentration of them. Uh, the zoning changes as I mentioned would be to recognize the minimum side yard depth also the maximum area for the parking. Uh, I just mentioned about the dwelling being four bedrooms and limiting the, the number of occupants. Uh, just some other comments, uh, cottage rental dwellings are an emergence, emerging form of tourist accommodation, certainly throughout North America. Uh, they are different, as I mentioned, from B&Bs, uh, as I mentioned before. We do have a licensing, um, uh, uh, or all cottage rental dwellings are licensed, and there is bylaw enforcement associated with that through the clerk's office. Uh, the major concern of the occupants, um, you know, could be a nu nuisance to the neighbors and we certainly uh, want to see that addressed and, and minimized. The applicant uh, will be required to obtain a municipal license and operate uh, to operate the dwelling. Just in conclusion then, uh, the applicant has requested the uh, amendment. Uh, we believe it can be supported. We went through a number of those uh, points. The fact that it does comply with the official plan, uh, it should be compatible with the surrounding dwellings. Uh, we uh, think through licensing it could be appropriately regulated. Uh, the bottom point there is the property owner has taken steps to minimize the nuisance complaints by requiring a damage deposit. He's also removed the fire pit. So just in closing, the recommendation is that uh, Council approve the zoning amendment application before it tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any uh, questions or comments of Council? We've got Councillor Thompson. <coughs> yes. Uh, first of all, I appreciate that uh, the meeting was called and the report has not been received uh, as yet, but uh, I'm uh, particularly interested in seeing the report come before we deal with this application. Uh, we had one here uh, several months ago and uh, uh, there was a very passionate plea from a neighbor who was having uh, serious problems with respect to the cottage rental ne next door and uh, the solicitor for the applicant uh, uh, indicated that certain things would be done to mitigate the uh, noise, the number of people, the other concerns, uh, the smoking, uh, from the adjacent property, uh, all kinds of complaints uh, that uh, were given to this council. Uh, I thought that uh, it was fair that the applicant was going to uh, look after these things, but uh, I think that uh, it's come to my attention that this is a, a really serious uh, situation uh, and is being utilized by uh, not only people from out of the area, but even from uh, young people who want to get together and party who don't have their own place uh, to have uh, this kind of activity with uh, uh, noise and rowdyism and uh, all kinds of other uh, unpleasant uh, uh, situations which cause uh, a lot of grief to the people in the area. And I think that if we're, and I'm not saying uh, that I'm not going to look at this in the future, but I think that uh, it's important that we have bylaw in front of us that is going to uh, 
Uh, because there's nobody there, there has to be somebody who is uh, directly accountable in a hurry. Uh, and it usually isn't the, the police to respond and to look after these problems. Uh, and uh, through the licensing, if there's one or two legitimate uh, complaints, that the license is revoked. So I'd like to see some really um, stringent uh, requirements in the bylaw uh, before we uh, deal with any of these cottage rentals again. Uh, they can be, uh, this one's, uh, uh, and you have a couple of letters in the uh, correspondence indicating some of the problems they's, they've experienced, <coughs> even with this, with this one, and apparently this one was in operation uh, without uh, having the uh, required license prior to that. So uh, in, in my opinion, I'd like to uh, defer this until we have this report, and uh, the, the report better have uh, some really uh, significant uh, concerns with respect to this, or uh, I'm not going to support it personally. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor, appreciate that. Just before we ask, get a seconder for the deferral motion, we're, we're right in the middle of the uh, public process, so I, I don't have any problem with hearing from okay. the appropriate people. Uh, but that's my comments, and uh, uh, if we're going to have a report, let's have the report before we make the decision. Okay, fair, fair comment. Uh, yes, Councillor Morocco, and then Councillor. And, and I will second that because I think it's only fair that not too long ago we actually deferred uh, because we didn't have enough information, and I think that we do need. Uh, as Councillor Thompson said, the, uh, the uh, bylaws and, and that right. in front of us before Was we start, right? just to be fair to everyone. Okay, so we'll hold off on that, the motion for now, until we uh, have a little bit of discussion. Councillor Wayne? Uh, yes, there's some things I'd like to see in there as well. I have a lot of planning-based concerns with uh, this application. Uh, for instance, there was one part where uh, staff suggested that uh, noise complaints could be handled uh, through our regular enforcement. Well. We don't have bylaw enforcement officers on on weekends, so that to me is uh, not uh, a good uh, conclusion. Also, um, I am really concerned about the residential character of the neighborhoods in which these are establishing, especially in this case where it's been recognized in the official plan as a scenic road. We have people from all over the world coming to appreciate the architecture along there, <coughs> traveling up and down that road, and it is very important for the financial well-being of this whole city that we keep it up looking good and it doesn't deteriorate like other neighborhoods have deteriorated when party houses establish in them. Um, the, the residential character is very important and we need to determine where the tipping point is. So I did uh, a count of the, uh, the properties within the, um, the rate circulation radius, just the residential section of River Road, not the part that's already commercial down at the uh, south part of the map, but then the um, residential properties along there and already one third are either B and B's or cottage rental so we've got a neighborhood where about a third of it is uh, already um, tipping toward not being street residential and there can be a lot of other implications from that as well for instance a lot of public services such as schools hinge on the residential population of an area and so if you have an area sliding to becoming very little populated by year-round residents, then that could have an impact on streets further beyond that. Um, I'm just trying to see. I had a whole bunch of uh, concerns here, but uh, I think there's a lot more that needs to be addressed in this bylaw than just uh, what we've been talking about so far. And uh, somebody, I believe it was one of the residents pointed out in their correspondence that a and b is different than, there it is, it's a b and b is different than a cottage rental. A bed and breakfast is an accessory to a residence. It's an accessory to use to a permanent year-round residence. A cottage use is strictly commercial. That's something altogether different. And I think we have to be really, really careful. There was some correspondence that uh, passed between Mr. Hrnovich and myself on this matter. We tend to rate one another quite a bit. And uh, <laughs> he uh, took the position that a dwelling unit occupied for short stays by the traveling public is a new kind of land use. And I think we must be very cautious in la allowing any kind of this, of this new land use. So I am for the deferral as well, and I would like to see it be Real, a really stringent bylaw if we're going to allow these uses. Okay, Councillor Carrier. 
Oh. Your Worship, if it's the council's desire to defer it, why would we go through the process of the public meeting, listen to all the residents, listen to the, the pitch? We're not going to deal with this until I, I think staff understands. We want to see the proposed new bylaw. Why would we do it twice? Absolutely agreed with that, and it's at the will of the council. We just felt, you know, you want to give the direction to staff now on how you want to see this as they come forward with this report. I, I think we did that already, and obviously they didn't get it. We wanted to see the bylaw before we dealt with this, and here we are dealing with it. I understand it happened to be the way it happened, but I think council is not wanting to deal with this until they see a new bylaw that has enough teeth in it that makes us comfortable enough to either su to support one of these things. And the existing noise bylaw doesn't cut it for me. So. Fair enough. Okay, we're going to ask the clerk to uh, comment. Yeah, just a couple of comments. Uh, we wanted to bring policies, but, I mean, we're grappling with it at a staff level as well. So we had a meeting about them, and there was a lot of difference of opinion around the table on how to proceed. But in fairness to the applicant, two things. Number one, his original application was deferred, so he had a right to come back and, uh, and actually has the right to hear, have the application heard under the laws at the time of, of his application. And secondly, as Mr. Bullabrook alluded to, we had already advertised the public meeting for tonight. If we hadn't, we wouldn't have brought the matter forward, but in fairness, it was already advertised. So that's why, uh, you know, and we apologize for that because it was obviously our intention to come back with policies, but even at a staff level, we know that we have a lot more work to do. And as Mr. Bullabrook uh, indicated, there is a matter that's before the courts in the town of Blue Mountain, and it would make sense for us to uh, observe what happens in that scenario as well. So this may not come back for a number of months, and in fairness to Mr. Hagerman, the applicant, he does have a right to proceed and council make a decision. He, he can go to the OMB even now for council not making a decision on this matter if he chooses. Okay. We've got Councillor Peter Angelo in wing. Thanks, Your Worship. I just want to say I will vote for the, uh, for the motion to defer back until we get a staff report. I, I think my comments will be the exact same as last time. And the issue that I have with these type of uses is the supervision of them. Obviously, the supervision ends up falling back on the residents that live next to them. So I'm questioning whether or not we even want these uses still in our city. So I'll wait for the staff report to come back. Okay. Councillor Wayne. Yes, Mr. Hagerman is the author of his own misfortune. He should have been following the law. It says right here in our report, it was being used as a cottage rental dwelling contrary to the zoning bylaw. The application was filed as the result of a complaint. So I don't have any sympathy for him. He brought this on himself. Okay, well, if there are uh, no other comments currently at this point, it's the will of the council. Would you like to defer it now? Wait for the, uh, the the report to come back. Hopefully, the the court case will have been heard as well, because uh, I agree. I mean, uh, obviously, we're a tourist town, and obviously, we're going to want to cater to to tourists here, whether it be bed and breakfast or otherwise. And it's important that if we're going to have this kind of bylaw, it's got to have teeth. And um, uh, you know, so I th I think it's important. I think staff heard loud and clear. You know that, that it's very important to this council that uh, you know we have an opportunity to revoke a license if they're not compliant. So, uh, Councillor Thompson, did you uh, did you want to bring that forward now? Um, I think I moved it, and uh, I think Councillor also seconded it. Okay, so we have a motion for deferral. Uh, it's non-debatable, so we'll call the vote of Council. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Uh, this issue has been deferred, and uh, we will make public notice when it will be reconvened. Thanks for everyone that came for this issue. We apologize, but uh, we're gonna we want to make sure we get it right. Thank you. Safe trip back to Kingston. Yeah, sure. the next item on the agenda. Your Worship, a public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to 
permit a 30 unit apartment building park and parking lot expansion at 6015 Barker Street. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Friday, March 30th, 2012 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passage of the zoning bylaw amendment to participate in any site plan process if applicable or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Municipal Board shall leave their name on the sign in sheets outside the council chamber. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. All right, we'd ask our, uh, our planner, acting planner, Mr. Bolabrook, to explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, the address of the property is 6015 Barker Street. Um, this first slide here uh, shows the, the building. Um, I just wanted to bring your attention to the, um, the trees in the front of the building. Um, these are the three uh, trees that would be removed if we, uh, as a result of a revised site plan. Uh, one of the tree is uh, kind of on its side, uh, crooked. It would have to be, should be removed. Anyway. We have one deciduous and one coniferous tree that would have to be removed if we uh, did uh, get approval for the site plan as submitted by, by uh, the Kiwanis uh, um, architect. The uh, first or second slide, I guess, is uh, uh, just a location map showing the subject property. It's about four acres in size. Uh, just the nature of the surrounding uses is kind of a real mixed uh, mixed bag uh, with north commercial, uh, south residential along Barker Street, um, east being a mix of commercial and residential, and the west uh, being uh, the cemetery and, and residential. Uh, what you see there in dark blue is the actual community improvement plan boundary. So you can see that the school is in the, within the CIP boundary. Uh, the the uh, few residential lots on the north side of Barker are, but predominantly the balance is not. Um, it, it really includes uh, the core of the, um, of the historic Drummondville area. Uh, some of the background, the zoning bylaw amendment is requested to change the zoning of the property from residential single family and two family R2, which it is today, to a site specific R5A zone to permit the former school building on the property to be converted to 30, a 30 unit apartment building. The application also is to rezone a portion of lands to open space, uh, also, uh, and that would be for park purposes, and another portion of the land zone general commercial for the expansion of a commercial parking lot. Uh, of the nearby funeral home. This gives you an uh, uh, idea of the site plan itself. Uh, the two acres, or just slightly two acres, of the playground area of the former school is what is intended to be retained. The uh, just under two acres, again, of the school property uh, is what uh, could be going to the Kiwanis Club. We have a uh, small portion on the east side which would be potentially sold to the funeral home and joined uh, with that property to resolve some of the problems uh, he has had traditionally with some parking uh, for his business. Now just on the, um, along the frontage of Barker, uh, the width of the roadway that would circle in front of the building, uh, that's a double lane and that's why we've re recommended that um, Three, uh, three of those trees would have to be re removed. Uh, a total of eight would be retained. Much of them are in good condition and they're quite a bit older and it's a, it's a kind of a mix of uh, coniferous and deciduous trees. Um, and we had to, um, we did do a reduction of parking um, uh, for the development and, and I'll go through that in, in just a minute uh, with you. We did have a neighborhood open house uh, actually on two occasions. The first one was March 21st. At that point, we had 12 residents approximately that had expressed a number of concerns. Some of them were, or the majority were, too many apartments already in the area. It will generate too much traffic. Uh, trees will be removed in front of the proposed apartment building. And as I said, we've uh, the architect has changed that to uh, minimize the amount of trees that would be lost. Uh, there was also the fear of low-income tenants, uh, noise from the commercial uses from the east, 
and the loss of a historic site due to the development. The members of the Stanford Kiwanis wish to purchase the former school and renovate the interior of the building and rent it to seniors um, 55 years and older. There was concerns and thoughts that uh, maybe the Kiwanis would want to put a second level on, on the building and that's not the, the case at all. It, uh, it would be uh, the existing built form would stay intact. Uh, they would uh, involve some of the removal of the uh, sides of the building to put in, in windows for the apartments, but no changes to the overall uh, building envelope. Um, continuation of, of the neighborhood uh, open houses. Uh, we did address the loss of trees, as I said. Uh, the second neighborhood meeting was intended to provide a little bit more detail on the site plan, and that's where we uh, uh, saw the discussion of the uh, trees uh, that were being retained and we talked a little bit about the park. Now the residents maintained uh, uh, their concerns uh, were similar that were voiced at the uh, first open house and the residents suggested also the city demolish the school building, convert the entire property into a park to commemorate the Battle of Lundy's Lane. There was also a petition submitted at that time um, of um, 88 signatures, and uh, they again were in opposition to the R5A zoning request uh, as it did not represent good planning. Uh, planning analysis, uh, starting with the provincial policy statement, um, it encourages new growth to be within built up areas. Um, they require or they have uh, re highly recommended 40% of any new development be within built up boundaries. Um, this would actually uh, uh, satisfy some of that directive. Uh, the proposed zoning amendment uh, is consistent with the provincial policy. It utilizes an existing building on full urban services. It will contribute to the uh, city's housing supply. It's located in proximity to uh, several bus routes. Uh, it does provide an opportunity for recreation and open space activities as well. Uh, the apartment building is considered a good example of adaptive reuse uh, of an existing school building uh, and we believe it's compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. It's been in there for 40 years uh, and is um, one story in height uh, except for the gymnasium which is two stories. Uh, and the nature of the houses in the vicinity are primarily uh, two-story houses. Um, uh, so it is a massive building, it's, it's quite large, uh, but height-wise it, it, it is not. Uh, it also is, um, with the two acres to the, um, to the north, it gives the city an opportunity to preserve that site of historical significance to the community. Uh, it's uh, the primary area, the schoolyard, that is closest to the uh, actual site of the battle that took place. 1814. Uh, the additional rezonings uh, deal with the um, a general commercial zone and that would be for the parking uh, area proposed to be transferred to the funeral home. Um, we do want to note that the provincial policy does encourage a mix of housing options um, given that the predominant housing type throughout the city is largely single detached. Um, the proposed apartment building is, is a good, uh, good mix of housing options for the city. As far as the official plan, uh, the lands are primarily designated residential, uh, small portion minor commercial. Um, the apartment, uh, comply, apartment building does comply with the official plan policies. Uh, we heard that uh, the development is too dense for the area. Uh, the density of the proposed apartment building is 44 units per hectare or 17.6 units per acre. Uh, that conforms with the density criteria of the official plan. Uh, the proposal is on a collector road. Um, Barker Street is a collector road. It, it is intended to handle larger volumes of traffic. Uh, and the density there uh, is 100 units per hectare or 41 units per acre. So that gives you the comparison that this site is, is actually uh, well within the, uh, the density requirements of the official plan. The existing school is to be used entirely with no plans to expand the building envelope. I mentioned that previously and mentioned that it had been there 40 years. Um, 
it does represent a good intensification of property and as I said uh, contributes to the housing policy of the city or the housing supply pardon me of the city and uh, it is a innovative form of redevelopment because it utilizes an existing building uh, and it's not that that old uh, built in the 1970s mentioned the uh, portion that is zoned uh, general commercial um, and for the official plan purposes when you're dealing with a minor boundary adjustment we do not have to amend the official plan because that that commercial boundary would shift slightly to accommodate uh, the new zone the community improvement plan we mentioned that uh, this area subject area is within the historic Drummondville community Im improvement plan the purpose of a CIP or community improvement plan is really to stimulate redevelopment of older commercial areas particularly downtown areas and this was a, a, a downtown I guess a Stanford at one time and where that's where we find lower orders of commercial uses uh, that need that extra help uh, for uh, different financial incentives such as improvements to facades uh, improvement to commercial buildings uh, we have seen a, a renaissance, I guess, if you will, where we've seen some real positive uh, happenings in the historic Drummondville area. And it can be uh, attributable to, uh, to the community improvement financial in incentives that we have. Also, the improvements to the, um, the, um, uh, the public uh, realm improvements along the street that have occurred over the last year or so. Um, the CIP does contain the financial incentives for both commercial and residential uses. Um, so, you know, it is there intended to help uh, encourage new residential uses of which this development could, could, uh, could apply. One of the specific projects highlighted in the CIP is the possible acquisition of the Battlefield School should it become available. Getting now to the rezoning, um, it is a site-specific R5A zone, uh, which would recognize the apartment. Uh, we, um, the building, uh, predominantly, uh, as I mentioned, is single story. The overall footprint remains the same, so I'm a little bit redundant there. But the site-specific amendments, um, they, we will include, uh, if uh, the zoning is approved, a reduction in rear yard setback to to accommodate the, the line of the zone. So the rear yard setback um, is required to be 10 meters, but will be recognized as eight meters. And the increase in the maximum lot coverage uh, from 30% to 36.5% to accommodate the building on the zoned land. Uh, the reduction in parking from the required of 42 to 35. We, there was 42 originally, but to again, save as many trees as possible, the reduction is to 35. Uh, the proposed open space um, will be for the parkland to the north um, and the, um, the it notes here that the city park is a good way to acknowledge the historic significance of the of the property the region is recommending a holding category for any area that's going to be um, um, disturbed um, until there's a completion of an archaeological assessment uh, so that would include uh, the parking area for, uh, for the uh, transfer to the funeral home would be an example of that. Um, the acquisition of the school play area will allow the uh, expansion of the publicly held battlefield lands. And um, as I mentioned, the community improvement plan does encourage new residential development through the residential loan program. Um, unfortunately, we've, we've ran a little shy of money in the CIP area for this area because of the, uh, the Sylvia Place market uh, <coughs> development, but the, the financial incentive program is still there. The proposed apartment uh, is a positive, will have a positive impact on the local economy. Uh, we believe the, the people moving and living in that area will utilize local services and retail uses. Uh, so it would stimulate the area. The building provides an opportunity for adaptive reuse again of the, uh, of the building. Uh, we've seen that in other examples throughout the city where some schools have been uh, converted to, to residential accommodation. This is the site plan of the area and um, we do uh, have a, a concept plan of the, of the park. Um, we have uh, made application for some funding under the 1812 Commemorative Fund 
uh, of uh, $100,000. We're hopeful to get a, approval of that, so if that would help in the, uh, the development of the park. Uh, those funds have to be used for things like pathways, uh, signage, and uh, statues. And uh, this shows a, a few cannons uh, <coughs> down in the uh, westerly section. Very quickly, uh, financial implications. Uh, um, we do have a uh, policy governing the uh, sale of uh, municipal land, and we uh, will uh, follow that. Um, once the uh, land is occupied or purchased uh, officially by the city, uh, the land is to close on June 22nd. Uh, the intent of the revenue uh, from the sale of the portions of the subject property were to help to offset the cost of the purchase. Uh, the apartment zoning, rezoning provides an opportunity for the Kiwanis to lessen the financial impact on the taxpayers by sharing the cost of the land acquisition. Um, we also note here the conversion of the former school into an uh, apartment building would contribute to the tax base of the corporation. Um, we've done some preliminary uh, 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 figures on that. Uh, and again, the adaptive reuse is considered a sustainable development. It maximizes the use of the existing building, capitalizes on existing municipal infrastructure services that are there and not <coughs> being used now, and does not add waste to the landfill if the school was to be demolished. So just in recommendation, Mr. Mayor, uh, the council uh, we're recommending be approval of the zoning bylaw amendment, and I'll, I'll close the presentation there. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Bolderbrook. Are there any uh, questions of council for Mr. Bolbrook? No questions or comments? Okay. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Municipal Board dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes. To, uh, yes, Councillor Cario. Thank you, Worship. When type of the, the same type of situation, I'd be prepared to, to uh, put a motion forward to table this. After talking with some of the residents, um, they think that they can raise the money to purchase the battlefield and demolish it. I'm not sure whether they can or they can't, but uh, I think that our staff has been in contact with the Kiwanis people. They're prepared to give uh, some time. They'd still stay on board with us. But should we continue with the rezoning or should we table this, give the residents their time to see if they can come up with enough money to purchase and demolish the school? And at that time, I guess we would enter into an agreement maybe to make it turn it into a park. And maybe in the meantime, we could also talk to the uh, owner of the funeral home to see if we could enter into an arrangement maybe with him to lease him or come up with some other arrangement, not to have to sell him the land, maybe to lease him the land or whatever, to lease parking for him. So I, I'm interested to see what the other members of council think, but I'm of the, uh, of the mind to give the residents the time that they may need to see if they can come up with the uh, alternative financing. Okay, so you're uh, suggesting a motion for deferral. I, I don't see why we would go through the rezoning if they're going to come up with the money and we don't go through with this and uh, with the Kuno's. So you're suggesting give them a time period to see if they can come give up with the funding? Give them a time period to see if they can come up with it, then bring it back to City Council to deal with it. I'm, I'm suggesting, I think in cooperation with the Kiwanis, that we would give them six months and that they would have some type of indication whether they're going forward or there's anything uh, on the books that they can, they can get their hands on. So you're suggesting we give them a period of time to come up with the funding? What, what are you suggesting? You six have, months. Six months. So we give them six months if they don't come up with the funding within well, six or, months. Or an indication that they can get the funding. Right. Or a commitment. Because in six months they'll know. After having talked to some of the residents, I think that they will know whether, you know, in the next 20 or 25 weeks, whether they, they'd have an opportunity to come up with the money. And I understand specifically, too, that this is a federal exactly. site. Exactly. That uh, if they're going to go to the federal government through our local MP, Rob Nicholson, that they would know within six months, hopefully. No question. And if not, then we would still be within the time frame that the Kiwanis would have an opportunity to continue without them having lost too much time. If you, if you don't mind just maybe just holding your uh, yeah, motion. Yeah, we'll Because there's a couple of councillors that want yeah. to speak to the, uh, to the issue. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I just wanted to say I don't mind seconding the motion whenever you're ready to take it. Um, I think my comments the very first time that it came down are the same as they are tonight. And I just, uh, I really can't see a government body buying a nationally historic site 
um, and then piecing it off and then selling pieces of it. And I think we found ourselves in this situation just a short while ago with the Optimist lands where, you know, all of us on council, we kind of said, well, we really can't help you because we don't own the property. Well, this situation, I think, is going to be different because we do own it. And, I mean, it, it, it's not as though we're talking about just, just any piece of property or just any piece of green space in the middle of the city. Again, we're talking about a nationally historic site. And in terms of historical significant properties in the city of Niagara Falls, I don't think I can think of many that would rank higher than this. So, I mean, when you're ready to take the motion, I'll be happy to second it, Your Worship. Okay. Uh, so we've got a uh, suggestion and uh, some direction, without a motion yet, from the council that, uh, that we look at a six-month uh, up to a six month deferral uh, to give the residents and the uh, people in that area time to try to come up with the, the funds to secure to purchase the, the, the site from the city. Because uh, the deal does close, I believe it's, it's June? No, June 22nd. June 22nd. So we currently don't have ownership, but we will in June. Uh, yeah, Councillor Gates? Uh, this will be to our legal staff. Uh, uh, we can't get out of that deal either, uh, from what I've read in the report. It's unconditional, so uh, no matter what we decide tonight, uh, we will own the land as of uh, June, whatever the date is, correct? Yes, yes that's right. And, and there's also um, been a number of issues raised, which I'm not going to get into too heavy today, but uh, to make sure that the process was done correctly, that we have some issues, I think, with the process as well. It might give us a chance to uh, take a look at the process that we followed uh, as well uh, over this period of the next six months. Okay, so yes, Councillor Carrier. If there's no one else that wants to speak, I'll make the motion for deferral. Okay, moved by Councillor Carrier, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. Motion deferral is not debatable. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Uh, with one uh, conflict noted. Uh, so the, mo the uh, issue, the planning matter has been deferred. Ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, notify you publicly when it will resume. In the meantime, uh, Councillor Carrier has asked that you be given six months to uh, work on securing funding. So thank you very much for everyone coming out. Okay, thank you very much. Moving on with the council meeting then. Our next item deals with budget matters. We're going to deal with report F-2012-16. It deals with the 2012 municipal utility budget. I know we have Mr. Harrison that wants to make a presentation on it. And I believe that we also have uh, Mr. Belowski in the audience who wishes to make a submission to council as well. Mr. Belowski. 
Did you want to talk to council tonight? <coughs> Members of Council, of your worship, the Mayor, City staff, and who else is left in this hall? Hall? I'm not going to fall within that, I will, not, I will stay within that 10 minute scenario, but I may have a little difficulty in reading some of the things because I only have one eye and the other one's got to do for injection on next Monday. Just a quick background. Prior to 2001, the rate structure was flat rate for residential, metered rate for the other customers, which were essentially ICI customers. The flat rate, the residential flat rate had a service surcharge which is approximately 150 cents, they called it sewer surcharge, and it had a small meter charge. I think it was about $60 for the year for a six inch meter. But that's, so it was very small. Now in uh, 2000, no, December 11, a new rate structure was proposed after metering of the residential customers. Council were deliberately misled and approved a flat rate service charge structure. So, uh, and they were under the impression that the consultant's report was attached to that December 11th report. In fact, the, council, the consultant's report did not surface until January 7th, 2008. That was the actual report. Okay. Uh, Ed, you can't yes. move. Don't move. I can't hear. <laughs> if you move, it's going to screw up Oh, the I'm sorry. Okay. How do I get that back? I don't know. Okay. Uh, Success consists in seeing the obvious and doing it. If any of you know Richard Needham, who was an editorial writer for the Globe and Mail, he was a very distinguished gentleman who helped the, the poor. And the other expression, of course, is self-explanatory. One test is worth a thousand expert opinions. So we're just going to go quickly through the scenario. The service charge, rate structure, present one is not fair, it's not equitable, and it's unjust. 
the investor came from the fact that uh, the consultant, when he reviewed the, uh, the rate structure in and uh, prior to 2000, he uh, turned around and determined that the cost share of residential versus non-residential was 59% residential, and therefore the aim was to turn around and with the new rate structure to get down to 55 residential. Let me jump here. Well, I can't read that damn thing. Okay, I better go back to my own notes. Now the service charge is a flat road structure. Flat rate means that the lowest user pays the same as the very highest user with respect to the service charge rate. And the assumption is that you have the uh, demand is related to meter size. In other words, that it's based on that type of scenario. However, for this city, there is no such a thing as any relationship between meter size and demand. Next. Uh, okay, what we have now is, what, what is the impact of this? Well, since 2000, the residential homeowners have paid millions of dollars on overpayment with respect to the cost share, because the cost share immediately went in 2001 from 59% to 76%. That has been the scenario all the way through. <clears throat> What's the impact of that? Well, in 2011, the residential homeowners overpaid by at least two, three and a half million dollars. Further, if we take a look at that percentage that we talked about, the 76%, Homeowners paid over $12 million on a budget of just over $16 million. The highest user used 7.2% of the total water, which was 936,540 cubic meters and paid a service charge of $21,210. If we take a look on the low end of a commercial user who used eight meters, cubic meters of water in a year, he paid a service charge of $1,505. Okay, now we're just going to go into pure numbers very quickly. Ten highest users, you see, used over 2.7 million cubic meters of water, which is equates to 20.7% and paid a service charge of just over $213,000. The homeowners who use less than 41% turned around and paid a service charge, again, over $12 million, which equates to 76%. Now, below you just have the total consumption, which is over $13 million, and the service charge budgeted at that time at uh, Sixteen million two hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars, a little more than that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we just go quickly to the contribution to the service charge of the highest user and the lowest user. As I indicated to you, this is the consequence of, of the flat rate structure. The highest user, or the, I'm sorry, the uh, yes, the highest user in the, in the one and a half inch class. Use eight cubic versus eight cubic meters for the lowest user. You can see what the service is. It's seven uh, seven seven point two cents and one hundred and eighty nine dollars for the lowest user. This is commercial. And if you just uh, add on approximately two dollars instead of adding on one dollar and ninety one ninety two, you'll see what the total cost was was for that particular customer <coughs> last year. Okay. And the highest user in the uh, two inch meter. 
55 cubic meters for the lowest user. Again, over uh, 27,000 for the, oh, we just jumped over, it doesn't matter. We can go down, we're not the three inch meter class where we have 660 cubic meters for the lowest user and um, over 48,000. Contribution on the right, which is in cents for the, again, for the highest user and in dollars for the lowest user. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, in the four inch meter class, four inch meter highest consumer use 160 cubic, 160 and 215,000, 160, 215,000 cubic meters of water, lowest user use one. 1,404, whoop, oh God, how am I getting this thing? I gotta get away from this. Okay, now, we'll just go now to turn around and show you, okay. Oh, now this summarizes the highest versus the lowest users by meter size. So, as I say, you have the, the copies of that, so just move on to the next slide. Here we have the residential customers, highest users by class, which shows that we're in the $2 range again for a cubic meter for the lowest users, and if we go or to the highest users, and if we go to the lowest users and we pick 20 cubic meters, but there's a significant number of users that are below that amount. And uh, that allows that to, for the low user at 20 cubic meters a year to $27.17 a cubic meter. Okay. Now, in yeah, October 29th, staff presented a report to review the report that I had. This is in the year 2007, and they said that the staff advises that the demand or the, the meter size is related to the demand uh, and of the, the customer, in essence. And of course, there is no relationship, and this will be borne out by the few slides that we got coming up. Now, we report that we're talking about meter size. There's only 11 meter sizes that the city recognizes in its rate structure. But if you go to the rate, the number of meters, you'll find that there are 20 different meter sizes. What's the consequence of that? The meter is measuring volume, and if you get to the 6.2 or 6 by the compound meter 6 by 2 inch, you'll find that that meter is capable of measuring over 100,000 cubic meters, which is what, what equates to what that highest customer is using. Okay, next. Now, <coughs> what we have on this side is an inch and a half customers. All the customers for the year, and they show you the, the volume, in other words, of the usage of that customer. And you'll see that we start off with eight meters, eight cubic meters, and we end up before the, the right side. Just that we end up at the column just before the left side, which shows four thousand something cubic meters. 4,000 cubic meters is less than one to one inch meter. That would, be, that would be in that class. So these individuals that you see, there's 242, I think, of these customers, but you're nearly 200, 200 plus of them were overcharged by $1,505 because they don't belong in there. And as you can see, there's no relationship between demand and meter size. You mean to say I need an inch and a half meter to measure eight cubic meters, and then I should be charged a service charge of $1,505, whereas the highest user in this particular instance used more than 21,000 cubic meters. Next, next slide, please. This is the two inch meter. We couldn't fit them all in, so the extreme right shows you the high end. But look at all the customers on the left side that are below just over 5,000 cubic meters. They are paying $3,030. 
they all belong in a, a, a one liter class, less than that, in other words, $500. So they all pay $2,500 a year more than they should have. So they were overbilled by $2,500. Next. This is the three inch meter class. It shows you all the low meters or the low volume used in that, which equates to that. And, uh, and I only section them, but that's all I'm saying is that the highest guys over on the right, the 48,000 cubic meter people, were the, what, they could stay in that class. But everybody else below, belongs in a class lower than that. So if you're a person on the left side with the low demand, for the 4H, four, four which I believe is $1,040, then you're overpaying by $5,500. Okay, next. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the 4H class. This is one. Regardless, you know, you know the scenario, so you can turn around and work this out for yourself, but the 4 inch person is now paying approximately they would be paying $11,110 and, and the people on the left side would be overpaying by $10,500. That's to me a flat rate by any definition and way overpayment because the wrong meter size. Now it might not be the fault because these people probably inherit a lot of things when they moved in from in 2000 but that's not Nobody was informed and told them that, you know, check out the meter size and we should know what it is. That's the way it is. They're, they've overpaid and the, the consequence you see the people on the far right are the ones that could stay in the four inch meter class. Okay, next. This is a six inch meter class. It shows that only two of the six meter people belong in that six inch meter definition of you know, meter sizes by demand, which is not true. And at the far left, you can see what we have. We have a scenario here that you've got 935, 936, 540 cubic meter customer, and one at 6,000 paying exactly the same meter size. Well, this is just a, a, uh, a follow-up that says that last year they said that we are making progress, and probably we are. That's what the definition is. But the, the 2011 uh, <coughs> and it wasn't included as the volume that we have uh, sent through. Of course, this is water treatment, and I'm sure sewage disposal. So it's just a matter of. I agree with staff in some instances because that could be a dramatic change due to some weather conditions or what. But nevertheless, you can't, you, you know, when you prepare data, it should be full data and it just shows a decrease and all of a sudden a two and a half million dollar increase. Okay, next. Uh, okay, now you have the uh, statement. Oh, well, it's not included, but what was that? I can't see, but there's the last two pages in 2011, uh, in this report here, 2012, I'm sorry. We have a, a staff makes a statement that we're moving in the opposite direction. The rest of the people are going down in their purchases of water, but we are having a different trend, and it's due to the fact that development and assessment shows this. Well, that's not factual because that's not what happened. If you take a look at that chart, you'll see that there's a misinterpretation of data. You have, take a look at the eight inch meter customer, you'll see that for the year, the past year, the usage was over close to 700,000 cubic meters. But the eight inch customer, one customer, used 600, just over 630,000 cubic meters. What we have is, that's a one, one shot deal. That customer is not due to development, 
It's not due to assessment. It is a contractor that is using water for process and he'll be gone and maybe this year. So we shouldn't misinterpret what that data says. And also you have the same thing. So therefore, if you take that and deduct it from the sold and translate that back to the 20% loss, you'll come up with a number of 800,000 cubic meters approximately. Take that from what you bought from the city and you'll find that the trend is down like everybody else in that direction. <coughs> First, uh, uh, there's just some small little things that staff reported that, we, that the uh, volumetric rate from the region was down to uh, 53.5 meters, uh, 5 cents, 53.5 cents, it's 53.4, but that's just a small thing, could be a tip, an error on their part. Now, it's uh, in 2010, staff stated that the new rate structure to, for 2011 utility budget, that was one of the things we were going to do. We didn't get that. And the ra reason for that is that we have a uh, region doing a study. But the region study has nothing to do with the rate structure for service charge. Absolutely nothing to do with it. And then they also reported last year that, oh, well, we want to do an, an investigation. The investigation, they state, was for check backflow preventers on large meters and bypasses. That, again, has absolutely nothing to do with that. What we have here, and you can see now, very simply, a flat rate structure. And, the new, and they promised a new rate structure. And last year, when I had a meeting with them, they said, Ed, we're going to turn around and present a new rate structure. That didn't happen. So, M in Mr. fairness Belowski, to I was just both wondering, council and... Mr. Belowski? Yes? I was just wondering if you were almost concluding. I'm just concluding. OK, perfect. OK, I'm just going to make a small recommendation. It's, you have all the data here in that chart. I, uh, I think it's not fair for staff to respond to that because they just got it and let them critique the hell out of it. I think it's up to council now to take a look and determine whether we do have a flat rate structure as right from day one and as a result of it, is it fair and equitable, the numbers that you see? I think council should study that. And what I would recommend is that the recommendations there is no recommendations approved today, and that staff and, and that staff come back with a new rate structure with options to council, and that's not difficult to do. I've already done it, but I never completed it. Present options that will start moving this to fairness, because simple scenario: I'm, I'm a restaurant owner, you're a restaurant owner, but you have large volume, so I'm. Shouldn't I pay exactly the same for water as you should pay? Makes only sense. That's what the fairness is all about. Because an, or a big hotel versus a little hotel or motel, should they not turn around and compete on the same terms as anybody else? The small guys, the commercial guys, as you see, have already overpaid because they're in the wrong meter class. So, as I say, my recommendation is the council pour over the data and then see if I'm on track or not, whether it's just some wild, fancy idea that I've studied for the last six years. And let staff come back and say, what, what, do they agree or disagree? Are these numbers, they're numbers that they provided to me. And then one other little scenario is that we have this uh, low flow toilet. That, is that not who, uh, are little guys going to buy it? The poor person going to buy it to save a little bit of water? He only uses eight or ten. And then the only other fact that is that there are 2,000, more than 2,000 people, residential homeowners that use less than 50 cubic meters of water. There are 250 that use less than 5 to 10 cubic meters of water. 
those are the people, don't get helped by a reduction or else have a low flow toilet, the reduction's got to be in the service charge. And, and we've got to work that council or the staff have to work in that direction. And council can only say yes or no to simple facts. Is this fair and equitable? And if, it, if it's not, then I see no reason. And there's no reason for having to turn around and say, oh, we're not changing rates. Which basically, you know, the same two cents are upside down. That's not the issue. The issue is present council with, because there, because there is no change, basically, present council with some options. And as I said, that, that's not a, a big deal. Within one hour with the fancy computers and all that, we've had recommendations. They come up in short order. And uh, as I say, if I had a little better eyes, I'd be able to see and I wouldn't mess up your machine. So I'm here to answer any questions if you have with respect to what I have presented. If not, I would respectfully submit that council should not approve that rate structure, should have a chance to look at it. Staff critique the hell out of the data that I presented, and that's only data, and as I said, one test for a thousand X. Let's put opinions in it. If an eight meter guy should be paying, an eight cubic meter user should be paying the same as a, a uh, 48,000 or 27,000 customer, that's for you people to, to model and figure out what you want. Okay, thank okay, you, Mr. Pulowski. We appreciate I your time. I tried 10 minutes, but even with the quick charts and a bad eye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll now ask Mr. Harrison to give his presentation. Thank you, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Um, in, for, in front of you are, are uh, two reports, one regarding the budget and uh, one regarding the uh, uh, regional wastewater rebate. And uh, it, since they're both, in the they're both in the budget presentation, I'd like to be able to deal with both. But we'll deal with the budget first. Um, at the beginning, I'd, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Bolowski. Uh, over the years, he's provided us with some analysis. He's provided us with uh, both uh, Mr. Holman and I have met with him, uh, not so much in the past year, but in previous years we've met with him, and he has provided us with uh, some um, ideas and with uh, strategies uh, that our staff can look into. However, um, I would like just to... Uh, uh, get started with our, our presentation. There's four points that we're going to be making on our budget uh, this year. Um, first of all, we're going to discuss the regional wastewater and water delivery review. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the city initiatives to improve water billing. Uh, we're going to talk about the rates. Our recommendation is to, that we freeze the rates at the uh, 2011 uh, category, at the 2011, 2011 levels. Uh, there will be adjustments between the various uh, volumetric and uh, fixed rates, but we'll be ultimately the same rate. And then we'll talk about the regional wastewater rebate of uh, 2.395, which we received last summer. The regional rate review uh, that we had anticipated uh, would be completed in 2011 has grown legs and has come back, and there's another review that's being done at the region. What the first review did is it confirmed the existing methodology for billing all the lower tiers. As you're aware, we pay a uniform uh, rate per cubic uh, meter of 5.543. On the water side, uh, we all pay uh, a fixed portion, uh, and that split 75%, uh, 25%. The region had wanted to go to a higher fixed charge. It's interesting when we talk about rate structures and changing it. Uh, a lot of the concerns that are voiced in the public are that we want to go to a full volumetric rate. Again, that seems to be contrary to what the region had attempted to do this past year, and it seems to be contrary to the trends that are happening in the region. And I have some information that provides a comparator on, uh, on how we stand in the region. But the region has gone forward, and 
they are looking at a totally new review. And basically, they're, they're expanded the, view, the review that they did in 2011 to do a full service delivery region-wide. The implication here is, and there was a lot of uh, concerns voiced by the municipality, and I know the city of Niagara Falls was on, on record as being concerned with the scope of the uh, review. Um, that's underway right now. We anticipate it'll be completed by the end of this calendar year. It will have significant ramifications to the municipality because what the mandate of the review is, is look basically at a one utility model. The next slide indicates uh, some, of the, the, some of the improvements that are underway. Approximately two years ago, we implemented an improvement on our, our issuance of water meters for new construction. We had some challenges that during construction period that because we've had such a growth uh, in the last number of years that we were losing water, so we changed the process. That process has been adopted by all our developers and builders and it seems to be working uh, fairly effectively, or it is working effectively. Uh, Mr. Belowski talked about our meter inspection program. Uh, I know Municipal Works has indicated or have started this program. What basically it is, it's a lot more than just looking at the bypasses. It's looking at uh, the size of the meters. Is it appropriate? Is it working? Is it functioning? A lot of our uh, commercial and industrial meters out there need to be uh, inspected and need to be potentially replaced. Um, as you know, the residential metering program started approximately 11 years ago. The average life of a meter, a residential meter, is about anywhere between 11 and 15 years. We're going to have to replace that, uh, all of those meters as well. But we're starting off with the commercial uh, meters simply because they're our high-end users. As you know, we've got a 10-year capital needs uh, report that will be coming in next month. What we've identified is that we're at probably 75% of the funding levels that we require for the capital reinvestments for water and wastewater. We talked about the backflow prevention program. Again, that's uh, more of an assurance that the, the uh, city water remains uh, uh, clean and, and, and uh, potable. And the last is the billing agreement. And we, we've been looking at that. We have a report coming back to council. Um, our billing agreement with Niagara Peninsula Energy is approximately 10 years old, and we will be coming back with a, a report indicating uh, how that's working. Just some clarity. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about what the volume rate covers, what the fixed rate covers. We basically have four retail rates that we charge uh, every, every account holder. One's a volumetric rate on the water side, and the expenditure that offsets is the regional water purchase for the year, and as I said, at 75% variable cost and 25% fixed. It also covers our water loss, meaning what is the amount of water that we buy from the region that we don't turn around and sell, and that's lost for a variety of uses. Maybe the pipes are leaking in the system, uh, perhaps um, the bypasses on the larger meters are, are, are working and we don't get the water uh, billed for a variety of reasons. And this, this percentage uh, poses a problem because every uh, percent that we lose is a significant impact on, on uh, our operating results. The fixed rates, again, covers the entire city operating costs, all our staff costs, all our investment in capital reinvestments are covered here. Wastewater, volumetric rates, again, that's a regional wastewater cost, 100% fixed. And so if we build more water, as we have this year, and Mr. Belowski correctly pointed out that uh, we have a large uh, um, a contractor in the city that's using a lot of water, which is uh, pushing the trend. I don't think that the report said that there was any assessment issues related to it. It was just that we were bucking the trend compared to what the other uh, municipalities are doing. But he is quite correct that perhaps next year, when that project is completed, we'll see a reduction in the, uh, the amount of water that we purchase. And the last thing is the wastewater fixed rate is, again, the oper city's operating costs and the capital reinvestment. So when we're looking at the volumetric uh, water rates, uh, the variable rate that the region has charged us is going down by 1.2%, but that's being offset by an increase in the fixed charge of 3.4%. All of the regional costs, as I indicated, is collected from the volumetric rate, and it also accounts for our unaccounted water flows. Our, our rates are going up on the 
water rate volumetric side simply because of the unaccounted water flows has increased. And instead of uh, having a lower percentage and hope that we do better, we're, we're actually going with what, we, uh, what, we're, what we're recognizing. We're hopeful that the inspection program that we've implemented this year will have benefits this year. Uh, again, we'll see. The one other thing is that we have a small stabilization reserve included in the uh, rate structure. And again, that's to protect us for uh, these types of things where we have unaccounted water flows. And unfortunately, last year we were unable to uh, uh, use that. We didn't generate enough revenue. So we've concluded that this year. On the volumetric side for the sewer rates, 100% um, is covered by fixed, uh, covered a fixed regional charges. The fixed regional charges increased by 2.2%. Uh, these are based on a three-year average flow, not the actuals. The region, as we know, uh, instituted a reconciliation process. They reconciled in 2011 for the previous three years. What they're going to do is reconcile the 2011 amount and apply it to the 2013 rates. The city of Niagara Falls has seen a, up until 2011, a reduction in its flows. Last year, 2011, was a significantly wetter year than others. However, because of the work we've done, we saw a lower percentage increase in our flows than our counterparts in the rest of the region. And as a result, they were impacted a lot more with the uh, wet weather than we were. Although we did see an increase in the cubic meters that were treated, we also uh, are doing better than our, our counterparts. And that's going to be reflected in next year's uh, rates that were charged. Once again, as I indicated earlier, um, the revenues for water billings is based on the amount of water that we uh, charge on the volume side. So as you can see on the chart here, we're not recommending a total increase. We're going to remain at 1.9192. Uh, there is a slight modification in both uh, individual rates, and that's, as I indicated, principally due to the fact on the water side that uh, we have an increase in water loss. On the sewer side, the stabilization reserve that we had input it in into the volumetric rate. Um, we don't uh, need that any longer. Our, our, our stabilization reserve for the sewer side is approximately at what was suggested a number of years ago. If you recall, BMA had indicated that we should have anywhere between 5 and 10 percent of our gross operating costs. At the end of uh, 2011, our, our reserve for uh, sewer stabilization will be about $1.7 million. So we're at about 7.8 percent of what our operating costs are. So we feel that we can take that out and, and pass that on to the, the oper uh, to the users. The fixed charges, again, um, we've talked about this before. The fixed charges cover all the city's operating costs plus the full cost of our, our capital program. The, uh, although we are, are, see are seeing some uh, net expenditure increases, we're being offset by the increase in the number of meters in the, in the system. And again, uh, we're able to uh, keep the rates at the same as they were last year. So to summarize, um, summarize, we are oh, oh, here. I guess I should put my glasses on. But these are basically the, the charts. I'm, I'm flying through a little bit quicker than the clerk is. Uh, but the fixed service charge uh, basically is, as I said, is going to stay at the same, uh, same rate we're recommending. Now, some summary uh, sheets we prepared this. It's not in the, uh, in the chart, but certainly council can have these. What we've done is, uh, in, in the tax budget, we always do a comparator of what the, uh, how we do compared to our contemporaries in the region. And it's interesting to note, and perhaps I should just uh, hand these out for everybody to take a look at. So, Basically, before we get to the summary, I, I think it's important, and these are really quickly put together, and again, uh, my staff uh, worked on this this afternoon, but we can see at different volumetric rates, uh, and these are all residential, uh, uh, these are all residential uh, users. So basically, they're looking at a small meter, 5 eighths, 3 quarter, or a 1 inch meter, and if you compare now, looking around the region, obviously the average uh, volumes that a household uses can vary anywhere from 195 cubic meters 
up to 360 cubic meters annually. But you can see that if you, if you look at a 360 cubic meter annual cost, you can see that the city of Niagara Falls, other than Thorold, is the lowest. And you can also see, it's interesting to note that, you know, we talk about a, a fixed charge system or a, or a you know, a, a fixed system. And you can see in the first column what the variable, the fixed charges are for a small meter. And it varies across the board. We are certainly not the highest, but we're in the upper end of the range. But our volumetric rate kind of offsets that. So again, one of the things that we said last year's budget was that after the region had completed its review, because there's no point in staff's opinion of going through the exercise of changing the rate structure at this present time, that by the evidence that we have, that that is, we're going to wait till the region has completed their review and then we'll take a look at it. Our, also, our, our estimate also of look, reviewing the, uh, reviewing the uh, inspection of all the meters will allow us to have a better, a better uh, handle on, on what the appropriate size of most of the industrial size and commercial size meters would be. So, as I said, to summarize, the regional rate review is uh, underway. Uh, the city is committed to improving its operational effectiveness and efficiencies, and for this year, uh, we're we're not recommending a price increase. We've been able to uh, consolidate uh, and encompass the regional rate increases uh, so that the rates uh, stay the same for this this calendar year. So I'll take any questions that anybody has. Okay. Does anyone have any questions of Mr. Harrison? Sure, Councillor Gates. Yeah. Mr. Harrison, uh, just a question on who's the contractor using the uh, water for another year? That'd be the uh, contractor that's using uh, Big Becky. They use water uh, uh, in that process of digging the, uh, the ditch and the big hole. That mm -hmm. we're <laughs> job, Eddie. No, that's fine. But yeah. I, I, you didn't mention it during your presentation. No. So that's, I, why, again, that's, why, I, that's why I asked. Yeah, no. Certainly, uh, and we expect that, again, as we've indicated, that this would be the last year or it might go into 2013 and we'd have to deal with it at that point. So. Okay, and then the other question is, uh, how much water is lost because of our, uh, our pipes uh, under the ground? We've used a factor this year of 21.5%. Uh, so we're, we're billing 78.5% of what we, uh, what we buy. Uh, that's a little bit higher than last year. Last year I think we used uh, the um, uh, the, the 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 ratio was uh, twenty percent. So we're 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 again we're we're hopeful that uh, um, the water loss can be mitigated with the inspection program, and uh, we're hopeful that 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 improves. We also are investing again. Council should be commended. We are investing significant money in water main replacement, uh, sewage uh, sewer separation, and these are positive impacts that are reflective in the rates. That's a long term program. Again. Uh, but that's what we're that's what we're working towards. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Harrison? If not, then I believe that we're looking for a motion on the 2012 municipal utility budget. Council move the recommendation. Move the recommendation. Uh, very pleased with the report. Uh, I think Mr. Harrison did a great job, and we're also looking forward to the region study. So that will uh, be great when we receive that. Thank you. Okay. Do I have a seconder to the motion? Seconded by Councillor Cario. Any questions or comments to the motion? If not, then all those in favor? Opposed? Motion is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on then to report F 2012 20, dealing with the regional wastewater overpayment transfer to special purposes rever uh, re sorry, reserves for meter replacement. Move the recommendation, and I have a seconder by Councillor Thompson. Mr. Harrison, did you wish to talk about this one, or you already did in your presentation? I, I certainly can, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think that the report speaks for itself. Uh, certainly, um, we we do not have uh, adequate reserves for the meter replacement. Um, we know that that's coming. We also know that um, we're spending approximately 75 percent. I mean, those numbers are off the top of my head, but I think it's 75% of what we anticipate we need in the capital program for water and sewer replacement. 
I think this is an opportunity. It's, uh, it's uh, money that's going to be well spent. This is a cost that we are going to incur. We will need to replace these meters and it's an opportunity for us to improve. Again, if we improve uh, uh, by, uh, you know, our, our water billing by 1%, that's a positive impact for everybody else because then we can offset uh, any increased in costs in the future. So staff is very comfortable in recommending uh, making that recommendation. Okay. Do I have any comments to the motion at all? Councillor Gates. No, this is on, on the 2385000 That's correct. Um, I, I'm not going to support the motion. Um, I believe that the uh, residents should get the uh, the money back, even though it's it's shown here. If you divide it up, uh, it's $85 uh, per per person, but uh, uh, or account holder, I guess. Uh, the reality is that the overpayment was done by the residents, and uh, the residents should get their money back. So that's my opinion of it. Okay, Councillor Wayne. We had the same debate a uh, council or two back, and. Uh, I recall staff bringing forward figures at that time showing us how much it was costing us to do the rebate, to, to process everything and mail rebates back. And it was money wasted, especially since we're going to have to grab the money back anyhow in order to, uh, to do the capital works we need. I mean, the, the amount allocated in 2011 to fund our sewer infrastructure repairs was $4.2 million. And um, we need to spend 5.7. Um, the water budget, uh, and this is all coming out of that same account. The water budget uh, right now has an amount of 4.1 million, but we have identified funding requirements uh, of 5.23. And the water meter replacement program, which we also have to do, is on top of both of those, and that's 8 million total. So if we want to waste all kinds of money refunding $85 and then take back 100, then so be it. But it doesn't make any uh, kind of uh, common sense. Mr. Harrison, did you want to address on how we did it last time? I thought that what we did was we um, just didn't charge residents uh, until the actual overpayment had run out, and then and then we started to accrue their accounts. We were able to uh, utilize the uh, uh, NPE, of course, did the billing, and those account holders that uh, those account holders that had an existing account. Uh, were credited uh, a percentage. Uh, then we had a process for people that may have left. Again, it was a difficult process for the the people that had left, and and a difficult. It, it was a time-consuming process. I know uh, that we spent a lot of time on that, um, but certainly uh, it, that that's a. I I don't recall right now what the exact costs were to do that. I know that. If they're, for the majority of the accounts, a large portion of them that were in existence at the time that the rebate was, in, was generated, uh, if they still were a, an account holder, uh, they, they simply had a credit that they used as a percentage. Um, but again, for those account holders that weren't, uh, that had left or gone, uh, left the city or something like that, it was a little bit more of a difficult process. Okay, thank you. Um, do I have any other councillors who... No, I think uh, Councillor Wing addressed uh, what I was, where I was going as well. I think that uh, we're either going to give it back or we're going to zing them twice as much later on. I think we just take that money and invest it into where we're going to have to take it. It's going to be a lot cheaper, so uh, I support the recommendation. Okay. Any other comments? Oh, Councillor Gates. Well, I, th I think I'd like to comment on, on, on both my fellow councillors' uh, comments. Um, I'll repeat again that we took it from residents. Uh, the residents that are still here can get a credit. Uh, it's my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong, please, uh, Mr. Harrison. Uh, but the other concern is there's a lot of residents that contribute to this uh, that have either left or are no longer on it, and uh, they contribute to that total amount. Uh, so I can appreciate what my fellow councillors are saying, but uh, I'm still going to stay with my position that uh, we should give it back. And when we do the vote, I'd like to record a vote as well. Okay. Are there any other comments to the motion? Uh, Mayor Dear Daddy. Yeah, I, I will support the uh, the motion. Uh, you know, the main reason being, I, I was at the region when we fought for this uh, $2.385 million, uh, led by myself and the Mayor of Welland. Uh, we had the biggest um, uh, returns. And the main argument that the region made is that the reason we had this uh, extra money is because we had lower flows than were anticipated. They said we can have high flows just as quickly, and we'll end up owing the region money. 
and they just recommended that if you know this money keep it close because we may end up having to give some of it back and I I'd rather invest it invest it into the infrastructure than have to ding the taxpayers later on by raising the water rates so uh, I'll definitely support the uh, the motion okay is there any other questions or comments council Wing? One of the reasons we have lower flows is we have been investing in the infrastructure. Every time we separate sewers, we send less rain to the sewage treatment plant that we have to pay the region for treating for us. So the more we in invest in the ground in separating those sewers, the lower our wastewater flows to the region are going to be, and therefore the less we're going to pay in the future. On that point, Mr. Harrison. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify that. And I, I, you know, in last year's report when we did the budget, we showed the flows all the, all the, all the years. This year we didn't do that. Mr. Belowski did put that in his pr presentation. And it shows that our flows, in fact, were up last year compared to previous years because of the wet weather that particular year. However, proportionally compared to our, our counterparts, and that's where the mayor is quite correct that him, he and uh, Mayor Sharp from Welland fought for this at the region. But our proportional share of that, that those flows had did reduce, and so again, it is contributed to that. But we also had the benefit, you know, we did have increased flows. So I just want to be on the record, make sure you're <coughs> all on. Okay, is there any other council member that wishes uh, wishes to make a comment? Okay, then before we call the vote, I'll give my comments. I too will uh, vote against the recommendation. I think that we collected the money for one purpose, and now we're going to change and and use it for another purpose. I understand the issue that uh, if our flows do increase that uh, we're going to have to pay more money to the region. But that's why we have our stabilization reserve. Our stabilization reserve is quite healthy. As Mr. Harrison said, it's about 8% of our gross revenue for our utility budget, which is about $1.7 million. So it's quite healthy. And then the other point is uh, we're not actually taking this $2.3 million and putting it into a stabilization reserve. We're going to take it and we're going to use it for something else, and that's not what we collected it for. So I will vote against the motion too. I think we should actually choose a month or two and have a holiday from water bills like we did last time. But those are my comments. If there isn't any more comments, then I'll call the motion. Mr. Ayafita, please. Yep. yep. Uh, the motion is the council approve an allocation of two million three hundred eighty-five thousand three hundred twenty-one dollars into a special purpose reserve known as the water and sewer meter. Replacement Reserve, Councillor Wing. In favor. Councillor Thompson. Yes. Councillor Morocco. In favor. Councillor Maves. In favor. Councillor Cario. In favor. Councillor Gates. Against. Councillor Peter Angelo. Opposed. Mayor Diodati. For. Passes. Okay, thank you. That concludes budget matters. I'll ask Mayor Diodati to come back. part of the meeting everyone's been waiting for the uh, mayor's remarks that was a joke but that's okay um, <laughs> all right first off uh, uh, on a sadder note we'll start with with the obituaries uh, Ethel Fielding mother of Captain William Fielding was award who was awarded the military uh, Medal of Valor passed away April the 10th um, so our condolences go out to the Fielding family uh, Bill Abbott, uh, the husband of Marion, a uh, retired transit employee for 54 years, passed away April 15th at the age of 76. Uh, and as well, Saturday, April the 28th, is National Day of Mourning and an opportunity to gather and remember those who've died or suffered as a result of hazardous workplace exposures. We ask that you please remember them. Some recent uh, things that are in the works right now, Mike Strange's Niagara Falls' own Olympic boxer kicked off his run across Canada. He started in Thunder Bay on April the 12th. I spoke with the mayor of Thunder Bay to make sure that he received a real uh, champion send-off. And uh, the goal, the plan is that he ends July the 1st in Vancouver. 
Uh, Mike's already had some very interesting uh, trips along his journey. Anyone's been following him, he's had uh, uh, bruises, he's had pulled muscles, he's had snowstorms, he's had already all sorts of interesting things. What we would recommend is that you go to the website boxrun.ca if you'd like to support him in the way of encouragement, encouraging words, donations, or otherwise. And again, it's boxrun.ca. Uh, last week, the Regency reopened. Now is the Regency Athletic Resort. Um, now, a lot of excitement. I know I was joined there by Councillor Thompson, uh, Councillor Morocco, Councillor Gates, and Councillor Peter Angelo for the opening. And uh, happy to report that they once again have wontons on the menu. And, um, you know, funny story there. You know, I've got a lot of history with Harvey Ho, who used to run it for a long time. And um, we did business together, and, and I played uh, baseball there and whatnot, and I used to laugh. Funny story, Harvey, you know, when I, my wife, who I took there when I was dating her, uh, I wanted to, you know, I know the owner, I wanted to impress her that I knew the owner, and I'd see Harvey behind the bar, and I'd say, hey, Harvey, how are you? And he'd say, oh, Bill, how are you? You know, and I... <laughs> Yeah, and that went over well, and then I'd go, Harvey, my, it's Jim. It's, oh, yeah, I forgot, sorry. And then I'd see him the next time, and I'd try it again, and he'd say, Bill, how are you? So I just kind of accepted it. Uh, funny story. But it was great to see them reinvest in the property. Uh, they've taken it to new, new levels. They've refurbished the rooms. Uh, the place is beautiful. It's going to be a real great gathering place, and look forward to uh, spending time there and eating lots of wontons. Uh, also, an interesting bit of news from Oakville, uh, they just announced their coyote management plan and they mentioned in their media that they were following the leads of Niagara Falls and Denver, Colorado. Pretty neat uh, that the city of Niagara Falls has taken the lead in this regard and uh, you'll see more and more stories. I read stories in the Toronto newspapers. Everyone is learning to live with coyotes. And uh, for anyone that's got any um, uh, interest in following up on it, uh, by all means, you can go on the city's website. And as well, we thank Leslie Sampson for her involvement with the city of Niagara Falls. Councillor Wing, did you want to talk to that issue? We seem to uh, take the lead in a lot of animal-related matters. I know our uh, chicken bylaw has been looked at uh, by other municipalities across Ontario as a model. And uh, we were the first municipality that we are aware of in Ontario, possibly even in Canada, to have a mall-based adoption center for cats. I know the city of Welland is uh, getting one at the Seaway Mall now, but uh, we led in that regard as well. So we really have uh, come forth as a community that uh, has a real leadership role in animal matters. Yeah, it's pretty neat when we're getting reference for positive things in other communities. Also coming up, Arbor Day is Friday, April the 27th. Plant a tree. We're encouraging everyone to plant a tree. Uh, last year we were at um, Mitchelson Park as we planted several trees along with Councillor Peter Angel and the Park and the City Committee and a number of schools in the area. Saturday, May the 5th is Community Clean Sweep. From 9 in the morning until noon, you can pre-register at the city's website, then enjoy a complimentary lunch at Mick and Angelo's. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, also, uh, Great Niagara Ported Portage Adventure will be June the 9th at Oaks Park. And it will be an opportunity for you to put a team together, carry a boat filled with supplies. Uh, you'll be uh, doing a little bit of a reenactment of the portage that took place, um, you know, obviously along Portage Road, which went from Queenston to Chippewa. There'll be an opportunity to help raise some funds for the museum. So if you have any questions, please call the city or you can call Heidi at the uh, CAA Winter Festival of Lights for registering. Just in closing, a couple of items. Uh, number one, City of Niagara Falls is looking for your feedback for planning this year's Canada Day celebration. And if the residents at home and everyone in the room would take the time to go to the City of Niagara Falls website at niagarafalls.ca, uh, obviously we're going to be taking some new directions with the sale of Optimus Park for next year. We don't want to wait until the, the last minute. We want to plan it out now. So if you have any ideas or suggestions, please fill up the survey at the City of Niagara Falls website. Councillor Wing? I didn't realize that we were doing that. Uh, this actually came up last night at the Maine and Ferry BIA annual general meeting, and uh, one of the members present suggested uh, that there would be no better place for the city to celebrate Canada Day than um, the Lundy's Lane battlefield, because it was that is where the last foreign invasion of Canada, the main, last major one, stopped. And after that, the Americans retreated to Fort Erie. Yes, there was a siege and big explosion, and a lot of people got killed there. But that after Lundy's Lane, the American with 
Americans began to withdraw from Canada. That was the end of the invasion. And the fact that we stood up there and won that battle, we were the ones on the hilltop in the morning. It's, it really is a seminal event in the history of Canada. And yeah, I, know what, I now I understand why somebody brought that up there last night, but it really is a great spot to, uh, to celebrate. We'll go to NiagaraFalls.ca and fill out that survey. <laughs> All right, and uh, lastly, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry, one more thing. Uh, before I do my last one, I, have to, I was asked to mention this today, tonight. On April the 13th, the Ontario Basketball Association Tournament was held in Ottawa. The Niagara Falls Red Raiders girls basketball team participated in this and had a record of five wins in a row. The final game was against Chatham. And after six months of hard work and determination, the Niagara Falls Red Raiders girls Mant major bantam team returned to Niagara Falls with the gold medal. So congratulations to our girls and the Red Raiders program. Great news. And last up is regarding fire prevention initiatives. The city of Niagara Falls is launching Wake Up campaign, which will consist of firefighters conducting voluntary home inspections on Tuesday and Thursday evenings during the months of May and October. The firefighters will be providing public education materials to the residents and ensuring that each home has at least one working smoke alarm and carbon monoxide alarm. The reason for the fire department's continued emphasis on fire prevention is that the Office of the Fire Marshal reports that between 2006 and 2011, 60 percent of all fires in Ontario occurred in homes that did not have operating smoke alarms. Now I understand it's voluntary that, that you can ask the firefighters to come into your house during those months, the months again of May and October. They will come in, they will inspect. Um, not to worry, the goal is not to be there to, to find what's wrong, it's to help you uh, make sure that you're doing things right and to advise you. Uh, that'll be the main goal, I understand, of the event. And, uh, and now the one question I'd like to ask the chief, I'm not sure Councillor uh, Morocco would ask me to ask, will the firefighters be wearing the outfits they wear in their calendar when they inspect or something else? I don't know if you could answer that for us, Chief. chief. Uh, thanks for the question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, obviously our goal is not to uh, go out in any particular uh, set of attire, although they'll probably be wearing their Class B uniforms or their bunker gear to be... Uh, is that acceptable, Councillor? <laughs> what, <laughs> what we're focusing on is, uh, is some of the areas in the city that we've uh, had fire experiences in. So we're going to start with those areas and expand throughout the city and see how the program goes and see how, just how far we get this year. So this will be done by on-duty firefighters that will be uh, out in the community working with our fire prevention office. That's great. Are there any questions of the Chief uh, for our upcoming uh, opportunity here? No? Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. That ends the mayor's remarks for today. On to communications and comments. Okay, item one. Uh, DW. We did, that one. we did that. That's right, we did. Uh, Red Boss Pyrotechnics looking for an opportunity for Great Wolf Lodge uh, and New Year's in the summer and New Year's Eve to do pyrotechnics. Moved by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay. Regional Municipality of Niagara requesting input from the Council on the application by Sobeys for tourist exemption. Move approval. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? Okay. Uh, downtown BIA requesting approval of their budget. Councillor Thompson, or I'm sorry, uh, Morocco moved, seconded by Councillor Maves. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Uh, Marineland. Requesting to enter into lease agreements with the city to beautify their entrance and exit. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just a couple of points, uh, perhaps before Councilor Thompson. Who had a priority? <laughs> well, why don't we first put the motion on the floor and then we can discuss it. Councilor Thompson, you're going to move it, I assume? Uh, I'm going to move it with some comments. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a request uh, uh, by Marine Land. We had uh, some preliminary discussions with. Uh, staff uh, with respect to this and the clerk. Um, this is right at the entrance uh, to Marineland. Uh, they are presently, Marineland is presently uh, looking after the property anyway, uh, uh, cutting it and uh, manicuring it. What they would like to do is uh, uh, put plantings there to beautify the entrance and uh, also uh, through our staff uh, to, to lease it and uh, also uh, have the uh, staff 
uh, assist in approaching the region to do the same uh, lease arrangement and uh, plantings at the exit to, uh, to beautify the uh, uh, entrance and exit. Uh, this is uh, a property that uh, um, brings uh, millions of tourists to the community each year. <coughs> uh, the uh, uh, owner is uh, always out in the community uh, assisting wherever he can and uh, maintaining this property is uh, uh, something that uh, he has taken on uh, over the many years. This will be, uh, I think, a temporary situation because the entrance is being moved uh, up uh, closer to uh, the uh, McLeod Road area uh, in the next few years, but uh, he would like to have control over this. And the uh, comment of the uh, clerk is to refer to staff. Uh, he'd like to do this as soon as possible, so my uh, uh, motion is to uh, direct staff to uh, uh, expedite uh, this as quickly as possible so we can get the uh, plannings in prior to the uh, start of the season. Okay, got a mo motion by Councilor Thompson? Uh, motion, yes. A second yeah. by Councilor Morocco. Okay, now we'll look for some discussion. Now, Mr. Beeman, did you want to weigh look, in? Yeah, you know, the first thing, there's absolutely no possibility this agreement can be concluded by May the 12th. Impossible. My what? So, but May, May the 12th, 12th, that's the date he's, he's suggested yeah. in his letter. It just can't be done. Um, but the other thing that's, uh, that I think is important for purposes of council, I would recommend that council uh, suggest uh, that we negotiate an agreement with <coughs> the Marine Land uh, Organization because it might be to their advantage that the agreement not be a lease. Now, it is perfectly open to, to Marine Land to request <coughs> a lease, but there are certain advantages from their point of view of it not being a lease. Um, they, they would have much the same, under an agreement called a license, they would have much the same rights as they would have under a lease. But there are some advantages, which I'd rather not talk about on camera, which could be to Marine Land's advantage, and we have done this in other arrangements we've done with other organizations, and I think we might want to provide Marine Land with that option. They may say, no, Mr. Beeman, we want a lease. Fine, but I'm suggesting council we might want to provide that option to Mr. Holer. He can reject it. He's a businessman. He can decide for himself if he wants it. I'm just asking council to provide us with that flexibility so we can present it to Mr. Holer. He can refuse it if he wishes. That's a fair comment. Councilor Thompson? Yeah, I, I don't have any problem. As long as uh, they can move quickly, I understand the time frame. Uh, if it can't be done during that period, that's fine. Uh, just to expedite it, uh, the lease, uh, the license, uh, whatever is appropriate and fits in with the uh, with the uh, marine land uh, uh, desires. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Is there any other uh, comments or questions on the uh, the issue? Okay, then we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Okay, great. Uh, Town of Grimsby requesting support peti petitioning the provincial government to reconsider the cancellation of West Lincoln Memorial Hospital. Uh, it's up to uh, for consideration of council. C Councilor Morocco? Receive and file by Councilor Morocco. Uh, we have a second by Councilor Cario. A discussion to the motion, uh, Councilor Wing, and then uh, Gates. Yes, I could support the motion. Uh, you know, it occurred to me when I read this that they really have an embarrassment of riches. The West St. Catharines Hospital is just 20 minutes down the road. They have the entire uh, Hamilton Health Sciences uh, Service is just a little bit the other way, you know, and whereas we here on the east part of the peninsula are really suffering and losing our services. So, you know, this money could be them or us, either them in the west getting even more riches than they have health-wise or us here in the east hopefully being able to retain some of what we have. Okay. Uh, Councillor Gates. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Diodati. Uh, uh, this is an interesting for me, and also uh, I guess I may be on the different page than uh, Councillor uh, Wing, but uh, um, this particular uh, location raised millions and millions of dollars for their uh, new hospital. Um, I guess uh, on a bigger thing for us, uh, we've been uh, sort of promised uh, that uh, maybe a new hospital for the Southern Tier. Uh, so how does that affect uh, where we're heading uh, when you have a community that's raised that kind of money? Uh, so I'm certainly going to uh, uh, support the Town of Grinsby. Uh, I think we need more hospitals, not less, uh, uh, quite frankly, right across Niagara. Uh, the other thing I'd like to raise under this is that uh, um, I'm asking if uh, we have yet uh, got a response from Mr. Smith of the NHS 
on the review of the HIP. Uh, I put that motion supported unanimously by the council going back November, December time frame, not exactly sure, and I'm wondering if they've responded yet. Uh, I haven't received a response. I'm not sure if the clerk's department's. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other discussion to the motion? Okay, then we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, thank you. Well, a no, a no vote is a no, right? Uh, What's that? You voted against the town of Gensby? No. No, no, you voted against the motion. The motion was just to receive and file. Oh, that's fine. Oh, you're okay with that? Okay, okay. So just Councillor Thompson opposed. Okay, uh, Town of Niagara on the Lake requesting uh, Council support petitioning the OLGC to reconsider a decision to eliminate slot machines at the Fort Erie racetrack. Councillor Morocco. And, and I also want to add something to it, but should I wait until? Uh, no, if you've got uh, if you've got a motion, you can bring it forward. Um, I think that we just want to touch on this. We hear the struggling uh, times that the Fort Erie Racetrack and casinos are having um, here in, and uh, as well in Fort Erie and around. I'd actually, uh, and following some of the reports, the uh, news uh, articles uh, in the last little while too, and I think how they're going to continue to uh, survive. My motion is uh, that I would like to make a motion we send a letter to the federal government to consider amending the criminal code of Canada to allow for the province for the private sector to uh, construct and operate casino casinos and racetracks um, and that's my motion and of course uh, they would be still government regulated and uh, tax dollars would come to uh, all levels I think there'd be a bigger share for all levels of government if it was uh, privatized okay so uh, we've that's got my motion okay we've got a motion by Councillor Morocco uh, the idea of decriminalizing the, uh, the gambling and uh, regulating it, be decriminalizing it so that the private sector can participate in a greater role. Uh, we have a motion. We have a seconder to the motion. Councillor Cario. Okay, is there a discussion to the motion? Uh, Councillor Wing. Does it include um, this as well? Is, you know, because there's people who live in Niagara Falls who are currently employed. Uh, at the Fort Erie track and the slots uh, section. So I want to make sure that we support them. It's not just Fort Erie residents. It's residents of our and other municipalities as well. Okay, uh, Councillor Gates. Yeah, I, I'm not going to uh, support Councillor uh, Morocco's uh, uh, motion, but on number seven. Number seven, yes. Um, now, is, is she looking at something different than number seven? Or yeah, well, Councillor Morocco was taking it a step further. She's saying rather than just uh, supporting Fort Erie, she's suggesting if you can decriminalize it, then Fort Erie can go attract their own uh, private investment to put in a casino there. That's, yeah. she's, that's, she's taking it a step further. No, I, I understand that. And I guess, I guess we have to, I'll, I'll speak to her, her motion. And, and on number six, I apologize, I am opposed uh, to the receive and file. Just uh, clarification, okay. I was actually looking at this. Uh, uh, I think what we have to take a serious look at uh, exactly what uh, casinos were, uh, were brought into our community for, not only in Niagara Falls, but right across the province of Ontario. Uh, it was to diversify our local economies. Uh, it was to help the tourist sector uh, uh, create a buzz to come to Niagara Falls, stay in our hotels, go to Fort Erie. Uh, if you take a look at uh, uh, the other thing that was supposed to do was create full-time jobs in these communities because they had lost a lot of manufacturing jobs. Uh, and it was diversify the local economy. So um, I, I have to take a look at Fort Erie and say, okay, well, what's, what's, what's the cost of Fort Erie? The cost is they're going to lose a lot of jobs. The biggest employer in Fort Erie, uh, which is the racetrack and the casino, uh, will lose those jobs. Uh, where are they going to replace those jobs? So one of the reasons why casinos are brought into the province of Ontario, going back a long time, and I'm sure Councillor Thompson can talk about this more than myself, uh, was to create full-time jobs and to protect it. Uh, it's not to have the private industry involved. It was to say, take that money and put it back into education, put it back into health care, create full-time employment, they'll have jobs and things, and over and above that, you help the tourist sector. Uh, and Niagara Falls is our ma major employer right now, is the tourist sector. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm certainly not going to um, support Joyce's comment, but I'm certainly going to support uh, uh, 
the Niagara Lake resolution and certainly the residents in uh, Fort Erie for those jobs. And quite frankly, it's not just Fort Erie, it's right across the province. Uh, uh, they're closing Windsor, the same type of situation there. Uh, so uh, I'm going to support number seven, but not necessarily the um, choices. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Clerk. Well, I'd suggest uh, you may want to split them. Uh, do the Niagara on the Lake resolution first, and then deal with Councillor Morocco's uh, separate re uh, okay. motion. Councillor Carrier, do you want to? Sure. I'm, I'm okay with. That. I just want to comment on Councillor Gates' comments. Um, the reason I'm going to support uh, Councillor Morocco's motion is because I think that you can see what's happening with casino gambling in the province of Ontario. I think the provincial government understands that. The only thing they do really well is tax. So I think the only, the only hope that the casinos and the people have to hold their jobs is to let the casino gambling fall into the hands of the private sector who can maintain, operate, and grow that industry in our, in our area. So I think that's where Council Morocco is going with this. I think if you know, left to the, to the government agencies to continue to run, we're going to see gambling continue to decline in our area. I think the only hope that they have is for it to go into the private sector, and then when the private sector gets it up and running, like it does in many areas, that's very successful. The government can step in and do what they do well, just tax it. Okay. All right, so we've got, to, first we'll deal with Council Morocco's motion that we've got on the table. Uh, the motion to decriminalize. Yes, uh, did you want to speak to that, Councilor? Councilor um, uh, Cario, you're correct in where I'm going. Um, I'm supporting uh, the recommendation mm -hmm. by uh, resolution, yeah, and I'm just adding on to the fact that you know what I think that will probably uh, do a lot better, and hopefully uh, secure the jobs in Fort Erie and Windsor, and that if we look at the privatization and changing the criminal code because it's it's archaic, it's so old they have to really look at that because we've got gambling. For God's sake, you can actually gamble uh, online here in Vegas and, and whatever. So I think we really need to look at it and it'll be more competitive. We've got two casinos here and owned by, you know, or managed by one company. I think if it was two different companies, it'd be a lot more competition there. There'd be a lot more marketing and there'd be a lot more people coming. So I think we need to have that competitive edge and it doesn't hurt. So what I'm trying to uh, say is like, let's get the federal government to amend that uh, criminal code to actually say, okay, listen, they need to get out of the business of uh, building casinos and uh, they're still going to regulate it, there's no doubt, and they're still going to collect tax. But maybe that competitiveness and the professional people in the privatization sector will make it more successful. Okay. Uh, is anyone opposed to either of uh, these directions, one being the decriminalization, one for supporting the... For your you're I'm opposed to, oh, I'm, I'm opposed to privatizing. Okay, then we'll split the two. So, so why don't we do that then? We'll, we'll deal first uh, Council Morocco's um, recommendation, or uh, motion rather, that we that look to the federal government to decriminalize, get the private sector much more engaged, and support Fort Erie and other communities in that way. So that's the motion uh, first we'll deal with. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? Okay, one opposed. And second, um, the request from the town of Niagara and the Lake that we support uh, Fort Erie racetrack and slot machines. Uh, we'll call that vote as well. All those in favor? Okay, and that was unanimous. All right, super. Um, Mr. Clerk, any additional items for council to consider? No, Your Worship. Okay. Uh, now ratification of Committee of the Whole recommendations. So I'll do it. Since Councilor Anononi left. Yeah. Uh, 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 from uh, Committee of the Whole earlier, a uh, few items. Uh, the historic Drummondville parking study that the report be deferred. Uh, Kaler Road Home for Girls Soccer. The Council support the Niagara United Soccer Club's effort to attract a professional sport soccer franchise and commit expenditures up to $57,600 plus taxes for operational improvements and that staff be directed to provide an update report on long-term plans to expand the operation and address outstanding issues regarding parking, lighting, access, and field utilization for other community groups. With regard to the Willow Road drainage petition, the council not proceed with the drainage works to provide an improved outlet for Willow Road located in the town of Fort Erie, and that written notice of this decision be provided to the town of Fort Erie as required by the Drainage Act. Okay, uh, motion to receive. Uh, to, approve. Uh, to approve, Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Maves. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. A ratification of in-camera recommendations. No items. no items. Okay, move on to resolutions. 
got two resolutions. First, resolution the council consent to Centennial Square being the venue for a wine garden for this year's Spring Alicious. That's fifth year. Yes, Councillor Thompson? Okay. Okay, and the second one being that uh, there be a liquor license for the guy show to take place this summer as well. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Gates. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. On to the consent agenda. Consent agenda. Okay. I'll second that, Your Worship. I have one, but I have a question. Okay, so uh, first we'll start off. Um, uh, move count the consent agenda, Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. And you'd like to lift one of the uh, items for discussion so we can approve the whole other than the one you want. 2012 19. 2012 19. Okay, got it. Okay. Any other that anyone wants lifted? Okay, then we'll call the motion. All those in favor? Okay, it's a it's unanimous. Now we'll deal with um, MW 2012-19 Kaler Road Municipal Class Environmental Assessment Study. Councilor Peter Angelo. Thank you, Worship. Uh, the report deals with um, the extension of the widening of lanes on Kaler Road um, from I think it's uh, Westwood all the way north to Lundy's Lane. I don't have uh, an issue with the uh, environmental assessment uh, um, or the report that's in front of us. My question, though, through you to staff is, when are we going to be dealing with Kaler Road uh, north of Lundy's Lane? If you're, if you're traveling south on Kaler and you're coming to the lights at Lundy's Lane, um, a lot of times it can be quite a backlog there. And I mean, I'm just wondering if we're going to go all the way up to the lights at Lundy's Lane. When are we going to deal with the road that's north of Lundy's Lane? So I think there needs to be some turning lanes there, especially a left turn. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the section that the uh, councillor raised uh, has been included in the uh, 2011, or sorry, 2012 Capital Works budget. It was on the pre-approved list. Uh, we're just finalizing the detailed design, uh, getting all the uh, uh, Ministry of Environment applications in place. Hope to tender that work towards the end of next year. I'm sorry, the end of, uh, of this year. So it would be uh, um, a good winter works project. Uh, it is a fairly long stretch. Um, and if possible, we'd like to combine a portion of this work with the, uh, with the others. Uh, there's a number of uh, development applications, a proposal for a new SOBEs uh, in this area. So we'd like to coordinate the work uh, with them and in that area north of Lundy's Lane as well. And uh, so as we, you'll, you'll see some more specifics when we get to the uh, capital budget uh, discussions within the next one. Okay, yeah, Councilor. Your Worship, that would be great if we could incorporate the widening of, of the entire intersection, both south and north of Lundy's Lane, uh, into the same project when, when we do the uh, road widening on, 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 on Kelly Road. My only question is, would you have to do an environmental assessment for the intersection part that would be north of Lundy's Lane? Um, Mr. Mayor, that section uh, has already undergone a, an EA, I believe, back in uh, 2004, 2005. And we've already identified and acquired property and relocated utilities in that area. So we're, uh, we're ready to go. Okay. Great. Thanks, Your Worship. I'll wait for it to come forward. Okay, great. Councilor Thompson. Yes, I had that uh, noted also. At the time when we uh, discussed this, um, I appreciate the uh, uh, environmental assessment coming forward now, but at the time there was a great deal of uh, discussion and debate and concern from the residents uh, on the uh, east side of uh, Cato Road just before uh, um, Lundy's Lane. Uh, about the trees. I, I see they've moved it over somewhat uh, the roadway. Uh, does, this, uh, does this go out as notification to the residents who attended at that meeting at that particular time? Do they have an opportunity to be aware of this report uh, because they were at the meeting in opposition to uh, the Branscombe subdivision at the time? Um, yeah, Mr. Mayor, the uh Mainly about saving the trees. Yes. And, uh, yes. Uh, the public meeting was held in January. Uh, was well attended, um, in particular by the residents that had ownership of the trees at the time. We talked about property acquisition and requirements. We looked also at 
options to uh, redirect the sidewalk around the trees if they could be saved. We've done an arborist report. Um, and as uh, with this process, we will uh, file it if it's uh, accepted here tonight. There's an appeal period. Uh, once the appeal period expires, if there's no bump up request, we'll uh, uh, commence the design and we'll have another uh, session with the affected property owners uh, to talk about those specific issues. We'd also like to get some feedback from the Park and the City Committee. Okay, thank you. That was my question. Okay, Councillor Wing. Actually, I'd like to defer this because I that's what I was thinking was where does the Park and the City Committee stand on this? I know the Park and the City Committee is in favor of active transportation. However, the Park and the City Committee, as I recall from being on it, uh, is very passionate about uh, saving trees and the benefits of street trees. In fact, there is a recent um, issue of the Niagara Falls Review where the Park and the City Committee had a section, it looked like it was a paid ad, promoting the benefits of street trees and there were multiple points in there. So we're kind of yes. hypocritical now to turn around and want to remove 14 street trees in order to put in bicycle lanes. You know, it, bicycle lanes are fine, but when you're removing trees to put them in, I'm not sure that's the sort of balance that we're really looking for. I think street trees do a lot more for the overall environment, the cooling, the buffering from the wind, the you know, combating air pollution and, you know, the environmental aesthetics and so forth, like the Park and the City, City Committee described recently in the paper. I think they do a lot more than, you know, another block of bicycle lane does. So I would like to defer this until we get Park and the City Committee comment. So okay. I'll read my motion. Okay, so we have a, a motion for deferral. Uh, is there a second to the motion for deferral? Is, uh, it's, we're talking about the uh, Kayla Road Municipal Class Environmental Assessment Study. Okay, there's a motion for deferral. Is there a seconder? Mm -hmm. Ask last time, is there a seconder? Okay, then the motion uh, doesn't go anywhere. And we're dealing with the uh, original motion. Uh, that's it. Did, we, did we move? We didn't move it though. Right. Okay, so is there a, mo uh, a motion to move the uh, report? Yeah, we do. Okay, <laughs> moved by Councillor Maves. Seconded by Councillor Thompson. Any discussion to the motion? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, with one opposed. And on to the bylaws. Mr. Clerk, are there any additional bylaws or amendments to the bylaws for consideration? Okay. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Mays that the bylaws be given a first reading. All those in favor? Okay, Mr. Clerk. Bylaws 2012-22 to 2012-26, we're at a first time. Okay, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Second and third. Motion to have the bylaws read a second and third time. Uh, seconded by Councillor Maves. Um, all those in favor? Mr. Clerk. Bylaws 2012-22 to 2012-26, we're at a second and third time and passed. Okay, new business. We have any new business for tonight? Councillor Peter Angelo. I'm up first, all right. Your Worship, um, first item is Provincial Offenses Administration Courts. Uh, I understand that um, on Thursday, um, this, is a, this is a service, I guess, that has been passed down from the provincial government to the regional government. Uh, these courts are referred to as POAs as you probably already know. Uh, currently there's a POA in Welland, Fort Erie, St. Catharines and Niagara Falls. And I believe that the region is, uh, is looking on Thursday to reduce that amount. Um, and I think uh, the plan is to go down to only one. Um, currently it's the only uh, provincial court that we have left in Niagara Falls. Uh, some of the other municipalities have um, all four of the provincial courts, which would be uh, family, criminal, small claims, and POA, and I think that uh, both Welland and St. Catharines have all four of them. Um, Your Worship, I'd like to go on record saying that I'm opposed to losing the Provincial Offenses uh, Assessment Court in Niagara Falls, and I hope that uh, and I hope that Council will consider supporting the resolution. I think it would be a detriment to uh, to the downtown as well as to the residents who would then have to travel outside of the city in order to get to a POA court. 
Okay. That resolution for we have a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Wing. Uh, the clerk would like to discuss, and then we'll get Councillor Maves. You already passed that motion in October of last year. Pass it again. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently nobody heard us, so uh, we we'll have to do no, it again. I'm with I recall that. Person. That's that's what I was going to say. We did pass that. They're dealing with it on Thursday. Yeah, and and Councilor Peter Angel is exactly that's right. Uh, there's been a special meeting committee the whole at the region called for this Thursday night. Uh, ironically, it's doing Super Sad tonight, so <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, pass up my spot there. But uh, yes, uh, it's going to be dealt with, and, and Councillor Peter Angelo is right on the money. There's a recommendation to consolidate down to one location. Uh, so if that happens, uh, you know, you know, there'll be a big debate, I'm sure, regardless of what happens. The status quo, I don't see a, a lot of support for the status quo, keeping all four open. I've heard discussion around the idea of two, a north and south or a west and east, and I've heard uh, the discussion of one. So uh, no question, if Niagara Falls wants to uh, uh, have ours retained, it certainly wouldn't hurt to have a letter from this council go probably immediately to the region uh, so that we can uh, bring that forward. So we have a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by <coughs> Councillor Wing, to show our support for Niagara Falls retaining a POA uh, court. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Peter Angelo, it's all yours. Thanks, Your Worship. Item number two is um, parking in the city. And there's, uh, there's two issues that I have, Your Worship, and I was hoping that uh, instead of merely passing a motion on a new business, that I could simply just have staff bring back a report on them. Um, the one issue would deal with overnight parking. And, y you know, Your Worship, there's still a lot of, uh, of people in our community, and, and maybe even people on council, um, who, who think that you can park on the street overnight um, during the non-winter months, which would be anywhere from April to October, because that's the way that it's always been. Um, the bylaw has been changed, and a lot of people don't realize that. And, and, and I think council should look at um, uh, what it uses to, to simply to, to justify that bylaw. I, I'm, I'm not quite certain, really, that, that, there's, a, that there's a reasonable justification for why someone would not be able to uh, park the car in the street overnight during the non-winter months. And if anyone wants to jump up and answer that, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, to take their argument. Um, the other issue, Your Worship, would, would be with uh, uh, Mr. Ayafita. Yeah, I think Mr. Clerk's... Uh, well, uh, Mr. Dren can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we don't enforce overnight parking during the summer unless we receive a complaint. Okay, but it is still illegal. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I okay. So, so uh, Mr. Peter Angelo is asking for a report? Yeah, I just simply want to report, Your Worship, to, uh, to reassure uh, the residents that that's the direction that we want to go in. And, and, and I understand what Mr. Arifita is saying, but the bottom line is if you park your car, on the street overnight in non-winter months, you're in violation of bylaw. That's, I mean, that's the fact. Yeah, you're so, exactly right. Yeah, I'm not wrong on that one. The other issue you worship about parking is uh, is our parking passes, and um, I was hoping that, uh, and it can be in a different report. It doesn't have to be in the same one because um, they might come at different times. But the issue of the parking pass, I'd just like to make council aware of um, the process. And, and how staff determine whether or not a household should receive a parking pass. I, I'm, I know I just dealt with this, and I know you dealt with this uh, as well, uh, different, different complaints, I guess. Um, in the situation that, that I dealt with, staff was very nice. They, they allowed the homeowner to, to park on, on the boulevard. But again, that's still in contravention of the bylaw. Uh, right now, we give out parking passes based on uh, what staff perceive as uh, hardship. And a hardship is if you don't have enough spots to park all your cars. So if you have a triple car garage and you have three spaces in your driveway, that equals six spaces. If you have seven cars, you're now in a hardship position. So therefore, they will issue you a permit. Um, and that's what I was going to say. If you own seven <laughs> cars, I don't really think that you're in a hardship position. Um, whereas the person who, you know, perhaps might utilize their garage, uh, maybe they have a table saw in there or the lawnmower and, 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 and all of their garden uh, accessories. Um, they are being told by staff that they have to park their car in the garage uh, and that they are not in a hardship position. 
because they have that space to park it, even though they might not have a shed. Uh, they're being told that they should build a shed otherwise. So I, I just want council to be aware of what the actual policy is and, uh, and make sure that we understand uh, the policies that are in place, Your Worship. So I would put that forward as a motion that staff bring back a report on what our current policies are, and then we can debate it and whether or not council wants to change them. Okay, we've got a motion by Councillor Pierangelo to get to report back on our parking uh, situation in the city regarding uh, overnight parking. Uh, do we have a second to that motion? Councillor Gates, is there any discussion? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Dren. If, if I could just add a, a, a couple things. Uh, one, uh, staff would be, uh, would uh, definitely bring back a report. That's not an issue. With respect to the overnight parking, it's, it's quite a large issue. Um, I've been here 24 years now and it's, it's always been an issue. Um, but what's happened is the, the people who want it outweigh the people who don't want it. In other words, they want the parking restriction. Um, and part of why it's put in year round uh, is that um, it, it relates to you know, evening services during the summer. It could be a water main break, it could be uh, street sweeping. Uh, police have indicated in the past uh, that uh, it, it aids enforcement because uh, you know people aren't hiding behind cars when they have to go and uh, are they're called to an area uh, to because of a break-in or whatever uh, ambulance services fire services and um, and people who just don't want a car parked on the street in front of their house and and that's really you know it's huge uh, you know my uh, you know, give you an example. My father-in-law, who recently passed away, he lived in Hamilton, but would freak out when people parked in front of his house. I mean, that's that's the type of situation we get here. The other thing too is this community, unlike Hamilton, uh, and I use Hamilton as an example because they have to do it. This community has, uh, you know, a, a large percentage of, of available parking off-site. So. Uh, I think the, the, the past situation we can deal with fairly quickly. The overnight might require some uh, public meetings um, and a lot of input from people. Uh, but I know in the past when we've gone out to the public, you know, I was expecting something different and, and it was always, no, we want to secure that. Uh, just to let you know what we do and, and what we have done to, to sort of make it uh, fair to people is we don't want to pit neighbors against each other. And what happens is, uh, you know, we were given the mandate to enforce during the summer on a complaint basis. And initially we'd go out and issue a ticket. What we do now is we issue a warning with some information to that person, you know, advising that it's illegal, that uh, you, know, you, should, you should obtain a, a permit if you qualify, and just to give them knowledge first. So we give them sort of a warning first or a first chance. So that's our procedure right now to become uh, uh, more uh, customer friendly with, and, and not just <coughs> because the neighbor's angry at them one day and says, oh, I'm gonna get even with my neighbor, so I'll get them, get them a parking ticket. So, you know, we've taken care of that. But the, the overnight issue is a larger issue, and it's something that we're gonna have to go to the public with, seek uh, uh, emergency services, uh, uh, input on, and uh, it's a larger issue. Okay, uh, Councilor Peter Angel. Thank you, Your Worship, I just wanted to speak to that issue, and I mean, the resident that approached me about this, um, uh, I was very clear when I said to him, I don't know whether or not council will want to change it. Um, so again, I mean, all I am asking for is, is I want a staff report letting us know what the policy is. We can either reinforce that policy or we can choose to change it. And I'm not suggesting it either way. We'll leave it up for a council to be. Fair enough. Uh, and I had a question on, in the same regard here, if I could just, uh, oh, go ahead, Councillor Thompson. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, um, Carl's been here for 24 years. I've been dealing with it for almost 35. Uh, I think we got the best of both worlds as it stands right now in the congested build-up areas where there uh, is not the proper double garages, triple garages, uh, 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 large driveways, a lot of congestion, some kinds, sometimes duplexes, uh, triplexes. It's a, it's a difficult problem and that's where the permit situation comes into play and we have that option. Uh, the other areas uh, is only on a complaint basis. So uh, you've got the situation where uh, people have their likes and their dislikes and uh, I've had situations where people want to have the clear area in front of their house and a dispute between the neighbors and they'll have the three kids park in front of that guy's house every night uh, until uh, somebody comes and does something about it. So. Uh, 
uh, on a complaint basis. It works out extremely well, but uh, I have no problem in, uh, in everybody being aware of what the uh, bylaw is and uh, how it's enforced. But right now, I think we have the best of both worlds by complaint basis and also uh, permit basis to permit uh, people in hardship. So. Okay, and also it could be another revenue source for us too if we, you know, with the permit opportunity. Now, I, I had a question too, it was brought to my attention recently and I didn't, I knew the answer, but I wasn't sure why. And I don't know if Mr. Dredd in this regard can help me. Parking on the apron of your driveway, you know, and a lot of people have these small cars now, these minis, and they park sideways across the apron. And, and I, I noticed actually quite a bit around town. Uh, it, first of all, is it allowed? Um, for, you know, for everyone at home watching this, and and if so or if not, you know, if not, what's the re rationale or why wouldn't we? Um, with respect to that answer, it's part of the review process for overnight parking, so it's just not an automatic. We review it, we look at what opportunities there are. If driveways are close together, it creates a real issue, uh, a visibility issue. Somebody drop, dry, uh, backing out of the adjacent driveway, their neighbor, and, and they can't see around that vehicle. Where driveways are further apart, and there's an opportunity. We, we asked, uh, we, we suggested to them. However, we also say if a neighbor complains about it, then we have to revoke it. So it's not, it, it's something that's on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. and it's based on the hardship of, and, and I call it hardship, it, it's the inability to park all the vehicles you, you have under your ownership on your driveway. Whether it's, you know, a, a single driveway that has to put three vehicles or a driveway that has six or seven vehicles it's still considered, you know, lack of a better word, is hardship because they can't get all the vehicles on their driveway or in their garage. Uh, the other thing, too, is mentioned about uh, sheds. We, we give people the opportunity to, uh, to correct their situation. So in the case of, I, I can think of a couple, and, and I think the one that, that you were dealing with in particular, is we gave that person a year to correct the situation. So we issued a temporary permit for that person to allow him to correct it because we understand there's construction sometimes uh, and there's issues associated with it. At the end of the day, they just didn't want to do it. And so they said, I don't want to do it. I'm, I'm, you know, I want this, I want the overnight permit. So that's, you know, those types of situations, but that's typically what we do, is we give someone an opportunity to correct their situation. Unless it's a safety concern, then we will refuse it. I, I'd, I'd offer one thumb up and one thumb down. One, um, I'll start off with a thumb down first. Uh, I, I, I've had, with that exact situation, people would say to me, because I have a garage, I'm treated differently than someone without a garage. I, I'm expected to use it for my cars. And I can tell you, I know uh, probably as many people as not that use their garage for things other than cars. You know, they've got uh, their lawn equipment, their snow blowers, their patio furniture and bicycles, and uh, some people, just their junk. You know, and they use it as another room. And I've had people say, you know, why, why, because I have a garage, why do I have to use it for my car? You know, I, I choose to do this. So uh, just to, just to my input, and I guess we'll weigh in when the report comes. But on the thumb up, I have to say the warnings that you give first are great customer service. And I know I received one uh, years ago when I started my bakery distribution business, and I had one of my big trucks out front of my house, and and uh, I got home late, and I was out, you know, and I just parked in front of the house. I was so tired, I went in, and next day I thought I had a ticket, and I was so ticked, and um, and it wasn't, it was a warning with the magnet, and it was a great lesson because I never did it again. So you know, so on the customer service side, it's it's great. So anyway, we've got a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Gates, that we bring forward a report on the overnight parking and the um, uh, permit parking pass uh, as well. Yes, Mr. Judd. Just a point of clarification on the on the um, overnight parking. It, is the, the councillor looking for just um, a report that just outlines what we do today in the practice versus going to the public and all of that? Okay. And, and just one clarification for you too, Mr. Judd. So is it illegal to park on an apron right now? Yes. It, it's, if without uh, the evaluation process, yes it is. Okay. But again, you know, if it's a first event, we'll give them a warning. A magnet, a little flower. Yes. Okay, good. Does Dean get one? <laughs> Does Dean get one? Yes. Okay. I got plenty of room in my garage. All right, we're ready. We'll call the motion. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. And Councilor Peter Andrew, you had one other one on the Mike Strange? Uh, you... <coughs> oh, yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, uh, as you know, uh, I, 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 I missed the mayor's comments, but I think that he did mention, uh, I think you did mention the box run. Uh, by Mike Strange. Um, I was hoping that that would be able to, uh, we'd be able to add some type of picture or logo 
Uh, we should be proud of the fact that, uh, that Mike Strange is from Niagara Falls and that he's finishing Terry Fox's run and that hopefully we can add it to the city's website. So I, I would make that motion and I still have one other issue. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Gates that we put an icon on the city's website linking to uh, boxrun.ca to Mike uh, Strange's run across Canada from Thunder Bay. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. It's from Thunder Bay to Vancouver, Your Worship. What did I say? Uh, to Thunder Bay. Okay, thank but you. That's okay. None of problem. Um, Your Worship, my last issue deals with the uh, deals with the Niagara Parks Commission, and on the weekend, I know you were there. Um, uh, the Multiple Sclerosis Society had the MS Walk as they annually do, and lately, Your Worship, I think for the last five years, uh, they've had it in Chippewa, and when they have it in Chippewa, they start from the arena. And they go through Chippewa, they get to Sarah Street, uh, they go through Nordic Gate uh, onto the Parks Commission Trail. They then head south uh, to the battlefield, they turn around, and they walk the exact same route back through Nordic Gate and then back to the arena. Um, this year, when they, when they called the Parks Commission, uh, the Parks Commission told them that, uh, that there was a fee involved of $400, which, uh, which they absolutely flat out refused to pay. Um, unfortunately, Your Worship, the Parks Commission um, would not get rid of the fee. I believe that they did reduce it a little bit. I did talk to the lady that was involved from the MS Society and I said to her, you know, was there any special request that you had? Did they have to close a lane? Did they have to put up barriers? Did they have to add extra staffing for anything? She said, we asked for nothing, we received nothing. The only thing we want to do is walk on the trail. Uh, there's a porta potty that we put at the halfway point. We have to put that porta potty out the day of the event, and we have to take it away the day of the event. We cannot leave it there overnight. We add no expense to the Parks Commission. I, I just find it unfortunate, Your Worship. I don't often um, bring up issues that deal with the Parks Commission, but I, I, I think in this case, I mean, um, the people that are making the decisions need to understand um, that. Everyone you worship is, 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 is part of the parks, and especially when you're dealing with uh, community groups that are a that are nonprofit and that are raising money to uh, you know, hopefully find a cure for a disease. I mean, I know how City Hall treats them when we have the Terry Fox run or, or Heater's Heroes or, or MS Bike Ride or any of the other Man ones that we have. We, yeah, Man of Mile, we, we bring them in. We, we, we do whatever we can to help flourish that relationship and, and, and help make their uh, event successful. We really try to encourage that. And perhaps, Your Worship, instead of, uh, instead of hitting these groups with, a, with an absolute fee, which is almost like um, a barrier to, uh, to helping them, um, you know, the Parks Commission could maybe do some cross-marketing and, you know, hand out coupons to them for, you know, a buy one, get one free on their attractions. or. I don't, I don't know what, but perhaps they can encourage a symbiotic relationship. Your Worship, I just wanted uh, some type of word sent to the Parks Commission that, uh, you know, um, geez, I don't even know how to word it. I know what I want to say, you know, and I want to say that, you know, they, <laughs> that they work better with user groups, especially nonprofit ones that are, that are out there trying to raise money for a big cause. Um, and I guess I'll leave it in Mr. Arifia's hands, however he wants to word it. Uh, Your Worship, I think you get the gist of it, and I know you were there at the walk, so you can comment on it as well. Yeah, without a doubt, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo and I received an earful <coughs> from the uh, volunteers uh, and all the people involved in the MS walk, and uh, we assured them that this, there was a different management style in place before when a lot of these decisions were made, uh, and that uh, you know, uh, Janice Thompson is a very good chair, and she's trying to uh, make sure that she's got a good relationship within our communities. And I don't know if maybe uh, Councillor Peter Angelo or uh, Cario has a suggestion. Uh, maybe you want to weigh in and help us out on this one, Councillor mm -hmm. Cario. Thank you, Worship. Yes, I did contact the chairman, and I think we did cut it in half. Um, and I also made the suggestion. I also made the suggestion that it could have been a deposit rather than a fee, so that if they don't leave a mess in the park and there is no money to spend that uh, it can be reimbursed I think it's something that we're gonna you know we're gonna uh, talk about going forward and I'll raise it at the meeting tomorrow your worship uh, but uh, it's the way it is right now it's not within her power to change it it has to come and be changed so if I'll, I'll bring it up tomorrow at the meeting and uh, see if I can't get some some action on uh, changing the policy well maybe so if we have a motion going forward that we communicate or make communication from our council that we believe that these types of community events 
uh, should be partnerships. And, Certainly and would help if there was a resolution. So, so then, Councilor Peter Angel makes that uh, resolution. That'll be worded, crafted by the clerk. Mr. Wordsmith, and we have a seconder by Councillor Maves. All right, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? It's unanimous. We have a unanimous resolution. Any more, Any more items, no, Councillor? Yeah. That's that. the Peter Angelo hour. All right. <laughs> Does anybody else? Yes, Councillor Gates. Uh, I was just waiting for uh, <laughs> Councillor uh, Victor. To, listen, I, I, I just want to give an update on, uh, um, we were given in our, in our uh, kits uh, today the economic development uh, brochure and it talked about uh, it highlighted one of the manufacturing organizations uh, obviously which is a great news story for the city of Niagara Falls uh, particularly in these tough economic times but it was about Spencerall uh, it had a couple of nice pictures in there around Spencerall uh, and they talked about the number of jobs uh, they're hoping to get to a hundred I can tell you today that there are over a hundred jobs at Spencer Hall, including the uh, containment. Uh, we're looking at uh, increasing that by at least another 30 when the, uh, they go to the third, third shift in the General Motors plant. Uh, but one thing that I think uh, uh, not only the Spencer uh, group should take credit for, but also the employees in, in uh, GM, uh, the skilled trade and the production. Uh, the president of GM Canada, uh, Mr. Williams, was in uh, two weeks ago, and he congratulated all the parties on the fastest ramp of new transmissions uh, in the entire corporation wow. in their history. Wow. And obviously Spencer played a role in that, uh, which is certainly going to be good news on a go-forward basis. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, today, uh, most of those transmissions are being sent to uh, uh, Ingersoll or Oshawa. And Ingersoll and Oshawa want nothing but uh, the St. Catharines transmissions. Uh, and obviously, again, uh, that reflects really well on the manufacturing jobs that have been created here in Niagara Falls. And uh, just having said that, um, I only got one copy of it. I was